Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, my name is Rick Nefser. I'm the uh, life insurance uh, regional uh, for, for Genworth, covering all of our relationships in, in California. And uh, glad to be here. Uh, uh, first of all, we have a very long-standing uh, relationship with Penny. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, if you have any questions regarding uh, life insurance, uh, the, the support staff at Penny is, uh, is terrific. Uh, uh, continue to work with them if you have a relationship uh, uh, with some of the marketers. Uh, uh, so please, uh, please do so. They, uh, uh, they, will, they will recognize where the, uh, the sweet spots for the companies and, and uh, products are. So. Uh, I want to talk, uh, give you an update, a little bit of update on what's going on with, uh, with Genworth. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, Genworth's uh, typically competitive term life insurance uh, uh, products. We had our county term UL last year that uh, we sold so much of it we had to uh, slow it down. So with AG38 January 1st, uh, uh, we left our one, two, three position for sometimes uh, we looked at we're probably now six, seven, and eight uh, position. That will change imminently. I don't have the exact date, but imminent is the right uh, word because uh, any day now we're going to announce that we'll be back in the one, two, three position uh, on our 10, 15, and 20 year uh, term. We have a goal for term insurance at, at Genworth this year. And if we don't uh, uh, meet the goal, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to uh, reduce the premiums again. Uh, so we will be competitive. Uh, we're not, it may appear to some of you, you look at your spreadsheets for term insurance, it appears that we maybe are out of it to, for the first quarter. That's probably a good, uh, 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 good, a good thing to, to, to say, but we do want to get back into that business. We like that business and we've sold a lot of it over the years going way back to the first uh, colony uh, 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 products back in the 70s, actually. Uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, uh, TLC, which is Total Living Coverage, a solution for some of you who are positioning long-term care to your clients. Let me ask the, the, ask the group, for any of you, first of all, who sells uh, long-term care, who has presented long-term care to a client? Okay, What's the number one objection to a client when you sit down with them on long-term care, what's the number one objection that they come up with? What if I don't use it, right? right. And, and similar to that or close to that would be it's expensive, right? Okay. There's another way to do it. And these hybrid products, most of you have heard about the hybrid products. The, the linked benefits is another way to, to uh, refer to them. Linking life insurance and long-term care. It addresses that objection. And we don't take a position, Genworth has been in the long-term care business uh, 38 years, we don't take a position at Genworth that one is better than the other, it's just different. And every client has different situations, right? So it's important that you sit down with your clients and address the concerns of, of living too long and needing long-term care, but you have another opportunity working with the link benefits or hybrid products. So. It's very important. I don't know when you sit down with a client if you have a strategy, but there's a very important question that you have to ask first of all. Instead of walking out to the client and showing them a whole bunch of illustrations, ask this one question. In the unlikely event that you need some form of extended care, I didn't say anything about long-term care, did I? In the unlikely event you need some form of extended care, which asset would you use first to pay for it? Think about that question. I'm not out there talking to the client about selling them long-term care. I'm saying recognize that you have a, an investment portfolio, you have some assets. Which asset would you use first? What's the most likely answer from a client on that, in that question? Savings. Savings. Why the savings? Cash. It's cash, right? It's the least yielding, it's the lowest yielding asset in their portfolio. They're not selling and they're not going to sell stocks or bonds or real estate to pay for long-term care if they need it, you know, in the next 90 days or 150 days. They're going to use their, their cash. And what's cash earning right now? Zippo, right? Uh, Justin, what's a, what's a one-year CD right now uh, uh, paid? 24 basis points. 24 basis points. It's not even worth the paperwork. Uh, interesting situation. My mother wanted to buy, she had some cash, she wanted to buy a CD. I kind of manage her finances and said, Mom, it's not worth the paperwork. 
leave it where it is. You know, so clients have these safe assets, they're almost earning nothing. All we're really doing with the TLC or the link benefit uh, solution is repositioning it. And we're going to create a pool for, of long-term care benefits. So if I... Excuse me, Rick, would you repeat the, your first question? The, the question? Yes. I'll do that in a second here. You could just mm -hmm. page down to the yep. graphic for me. The question is, in the unlikely event, because it could be unlikely, in the unlikely event, Mr. and Mrs. Client, you need some form of extended care, which asset would you use first? It's the best question, because it doesn't sell anything, it's getting the client, and the other thing that we've done a lot with the uh, at Genworth is asking the client whether they have a plan of long-term care. If you have a client with a lot of money and a lot of assets, they might say, I plan on using my own money. I'm wealthy. I've got $6 million in the bank. I can use that to pay for long-term care. That client still could be a candidate for this product because it's just a reposition. So what if I could sh show the client that live, die, or quit there will be a benefit. Would they be interested? Live, die, or quit? Let me talk about the quit. We have a return of premium guarantee in our TLC product. In California, it's a 15-year return of premium guarantee. Not that you can't surrender it after that. There will be, be some cash value at that point, but we're guaranteeing within 15 years in the, in the California product, you can get back a minimum of what you put into it. No questions asked. You can get it the next day if you need it. So does that answer the objection many times that what if I reposition this, I might want to change my mind? I kind of say it this way, uh, especially women. Do they want to change their mind at some point? Absolutely. You're taking away the objection that I might not be interested in repositioning this. What if I live too long? The, the, the interesting thing about long-term care is that the longer you live, the higher probability you need care. We're keeping people alive longer but they're not going to be healthy in those latest years. That's what long-term care is going to take. <coughs> and you know the other objection, what if I'm one of those lucky ones, I live to 89 and a half, I never need long-term care, I have a stroke and I pass away within 24 hours. We pay an income tax-free death benefit. Live, die, or quit. Quit, the return of premium, there's a death benefit, you can leverage your your savings, your CD, your money market, and create a pool of long-term care benefits. If you want to just get an idea, this is a 60-year-old female on the handout I have. Uh, we're talking about, if you could go to the next page, please, Ryan. Two, One more. And then scroll down. One more, a little bit more. There we go, thank you. Okay, so. She's 60 years of, of, of age. She's not going to purchase traditional long-term care for whatever reason. We don't care. With, if we have a solution for this different to using the TLC, she has $100,000 in CDs at Bank of America. Maybe she has $250,000. We're just going to reposition some of that. We're going to create, in her situation, $220,000 death benefit. And we use that first for long-term care. So we can immediately leverage 102, haven't we? Two to twenty, two to one leverage. If she needs a lot of long-term care, we're going to extend the benefit after that for a total pool of six hundred sixty thousand dollars. Why would she object to that? We're using six hundred sixty thousand dollars from the insurance company versus her own six hundred sixty thousand dollars in her investment portfolio. And it has all the robust long-term care benefits that Genworth is known for. The, the interesting thing about this, just so you get an idea of the leverage, the older you are, the less the leverage, the younger you are, the more the leverage, right? Makes sense, right? Same, for the same reason that life insurance for a 70-year-old costs more than life insurance for a 40-year-old. You get more, less leverage in the, in, the, uh, in the later years. So it's important that you have this in your, in your portfolio. We've been in front of clients that look at this and the, you know, the first thing they say is, why wouldn't I do this? Honest to God, I've been in, in client situations 
where they look at the scenario here and they say, this makes sense, number one, and why wouldn't I do this? I don't know why you wouldn't do it. It's all about, like I said earlier with the present, with that one question, don't walk in and show, and I had a, I had a rep do this one time. Uh, he was interested in this product and he had a Genworth long-term care quote on our privileged choice, which is our traditional long-term care, and it was like $3,500 of premium. Client didn't want to buy that. He, got, he attended one of our, our workshops, and he took. He then uh, saw the opportunity with TLC, ran an illustration for $100,000, goes out and sees the client, he said, which one would you like, the $3,500 or the $100,000? The client's going to look at that and say, and have sticker shock. It's all how you present it. If they understood really what the $100,000 provided, most likely she would say, well, this makes sense. Again, it's not better than, it's just a different solution. All you're doing is taking money out of this pocket and putting it in this pocket. You still have access to the $100,000, do not you? Okay? Any questions at this point? A neat opportunity for you. And by the way, <clears throat> Link Benefits, not just Genworth's product, Link Benefits or hybrid products are a very fast increasing uh, uh, product segment in our business. 48% increase in Link Benefits across the industry last year, and it was like 40% the year before. You see a lot of carriers putting long-term care riders on life insurance policies because it's, they're spreading the risk. Same kind of thing in here. Yes? So if someone does need long-term care, is it still paid out monthly? Is it still reimbursement? It's a reimbursement. Good question. So how, how do you access this? If you divide it, if, if you had a calculator, I won't ask you to go through this exercise right now, but if you had a calculator, the $220,000 is divided over two years or 24 months. That's going to give you your monthly benefit. And it's, it's a monthly benefit if you don't use it. So let's just say her monthly benefit is $8,000, okay? 8, 000, it's about that, 220 divided by 24 is about $8,000, okay? Let's say she only uses 6,000 of it. It stays in the pool, it doesn't disappear. And if you use just half of it, if you use half of the benefit you see on the screen there, that's gonna, that's gonna last actually 12 years. We have a six year benefit. Two years right here, and a four-year extension after that for a total of six. And it is reimbursement. Good question. Here's another idea. I want to close with this idea. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, you have a client that has an old universal life policy or a variable universal life policy that they don't want to pay any more premium on. Example, a 60-year-old male who has a million dollar VUL policy with a $7,500 premium, and he says, I don't need a million dollars of death benefit anymore, I'm 60 years of age, kids are gone, paid for college, home is paid for, I'm gonna surrender my VUL policy. Well, guess what, if he surrenders that, he's gonna pay tax on all the gain, right? You can do a tax-free exchange from that other carrier into Genworth, and what we do is we split the 1035 between our no lapse guarantee UL policy and TLC. We can ballpark, here's some numbers, pay up $500,000 all the way to age 105 if he had a quarter of a million dollars of cash value in his VUL, take $200,000 of that and pay that up all the way to age 105, no more future premiums, and then take the 50,000 that's left and buy TLC. So now he has long-term care and no more premiums on his universal life policy. So talk to us about that. Talk to the Penny folks. If you have a situation, we can do a 1035 exchange. It goes from carrier to carrier, and all we do internally is to distribute it to the life department and the TLC uh, area. Question. Okay, if client, if client, uh, client moves to another country, this is reimbursed. So if I got somebody moved back. We have international coverage in here. Yes, exactly. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more? Yeah. The international coverage works this way, and uh, up to 50% of the benefit is available for four years. So we, uh, in the international, so, so the client buys it here, and uh, all of a sudden they're uh, visiting relatives in China, and, and they need some form of, uh, of care. Facility care is covered internationally. Canada, China, wherever it might be, and uh, uh, that's, that's true for, uh, for our um, 
our traditional long-term care uh, as well. But we do have international coverage in it. Not the, the, same, the, the total benefits you see here, but a four-year benefit uh, up to 50% of the monthly amount. So there is some available. Good. Not used Correct. Works the same way. Works the same way. You don't, you don't, uh, if you don't use it, you don't lose it. It just lasts long. Great questions. 50% of US dollar? 50% of the, the benefit that's available in, in, their, in their country. US dollar, that's how you account. Yes. Like you said, foreign country. Yes, correct. We're not going to do any for, uh, exchange, uh, uh, currency dollar. exchanges. It'll be US uh, dollars. My time is almost up, right, Brian? Right? One last question. You mentioned California, 15-year. What is it outside of California? Yes, we have a lifetime. Uh, uh, bring you up to date. So, so California is a couple versions behind on all of our long-term care. Does that surprise anyone with, with, with what's going on in, in Sacramento? Interesting uh, scenario I, I heard from a meeting like this is that Sacramento has 800 uh, applications for policies to approve not just one carrier, but all the, the, the products that are awaiting approval are almost 800 uh, right now in the insurance department. So there's been a, a, a delay in that. We have this product, this product actually allows for more leverage than across the state line. So the number in California, the pool number of 660 is larger than if you have our, our newer product. Okay, so the newer product is probably about 640 or so, 630. Um, the other difference is, outside of California, our newer version product has a lifetime return of premium guarantee after two years. Get them to the second year, and there's a lifetime guarantee. You can get your money back if you decide you don't want it anymore. Uh, we're expecting approval on the new product in California, hopefully uh, by the end of the summer. So we'll catch up. And by the way, right now, uh, uh, we've suspended, as you know, we've suspended uh, uh, traditional long-term care sales in California until we can get our new product approved. And we're hoping that'll be taken care of by the end of July, at least what, what some of our people are saying. So I want to thank you all for your business in the past with, with Genworth. Remember, we're, we're getting back in the term insurance game. We have a very competitive uh, uh, no-lapse guarantee uh, universal life uh, product. The link benefit, uh, the TLC, is really uh, uh, coming on strong. And hopefully around the end of May, first part of June, we're going to have an Index UL product uh, coming to board. So we're keeping our fingers crossed we can get that rollout uh, going. So thank you for your time. We'll be around, of course. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time here. Great. And as we get the uh, next presenter set up, um, I'm going to give you a quick sales idea. I figure this is why we come, is to get new sales ideas. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, our agency spends a lot of time uh, working with technology, using technology to leverage uh, both referrals and generate leads online um, to the tune of about 22,000 policies paid last year uh, using internet-generated leads. So we were very, very good at it. We know what we're talking about. But one thing that you can do individually, and I, and I actually know Nikel used this for, to some extent to help drive some of the folks to come to this meeting today, is using LinkedIn. And so I, if you don't have a LinkedIn account, my recommendation to you would be go get one. Um, but a really common uh, thing that you can do with LinkedIn is a great way to help you get additional referrals during your client meetings, as long as you have your clients as part of your LinkedIn network. And it works something like this. In LinkedIn, if you decide that you want to work with somebody or that you want to connect with somebody, you can see who already knows them. And so the nice thing about that is, is that if you have a client coming to your office for a meeting, you can actually kind of go through and look at their, their connections, decide who in their connections you may want to work with, and then you can basically very simply turn it around and say, hey, I'm looking to grow my practice. Um, here's a couple people I've, I've identified that I might want to uh, work with. Um, do you happen to know any of them? Well, of course you know them because they're already connected with them on LinkedIn. I would preface that with, instead of using all five, if you're going to ask for five, eh, throw in a couple of that probably aren't on their list because you don't want to freak them out. But the reality is, is that you can very quickly ask them, do you know any of these people? And by doing it this way, you've served up a name that they already know. You look at to learn th two things. One, are they willing to give you referrals? Because if they say no, well, they're either being dishonest or they don't want to give you referrals. Either way, you move on. 
If they say yes, then the, the, then you say, great, which people do you know and would you be willing to make an uh, introduction to me? Because you already know it's, it's done, it's not like turning around a yellow pad and saying, hey, write down all the names of all your friends and closest relatives. Um, this is a very, uh, very targeted approach to getting leads and referrals. It works very, very well, and it's very non-intrusive because you get to do all the research on the front end before they ever show up to the meeting. And when they're sitting there in your office with, uh, for that client meeting or that annual review that you're doing, you get to do it uh, at that point. It's a great, great way to get referrals. Uh, who's our next presenter, Nikhil? Pat. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Pat uh, with Nationwide is going to come up next. Uh, Nationwide's a great company, and we've been working with them for now for several years. I'm sure he'll tell you uh, more about uh, what they're doing. You can solve it down. Okay. And uh, so, turn that off there. Um, basically, Nationwide is uh, it's kind of unique in the market space because they're one of the few truly mutual com companies out there. I'm sure that that will be addressed. And... Um, and with that, uh, Pat, Appreciate it. thank you very much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks, everybody. Pat Hodes with Nationwide. Uh, just a little information about myself. This is actually my 22nd year at Nationwide. I started when I was 13. They started us early in the Midwest. So I um, have been was in the home office for 10 and have been out here in the, uh, in the field for about 12 years. So um, you're going to get a, a kind of a back-to-back -back presentation on long-term care. I think the one thing I'm on our life insurance products that makes us a little less unique than we were about 12 years ago, 13 years ago when we started, was we do have a long-term care rider on our life insurance contracts. And I would say maybe a, a, a quick compare and contrast with, with the previous uh, presentation, I think Genworth and I think products similar to that, MoneyGuard and some of those other products, they're, and I, I think this is a fair assessment, their long-term care where the, the death benefit is kind of a secondary nature. It's primarily a long-term care benefit. The, the life insurance is somewhat secondary. I think Nationwide is a life insurance contract with a long-term care rider. So we're not gonna give you as much, a, as big of a benefit, but I think we do have some, some ease of use factors that makes us uh, very competitive and very people really like it. The biggest one being it, we're, we're an indemnity long-term care rider, which means the clients never have to turn in a receipt and more importantly, if there's money left over, clients can use that money however they want. So I, I ran, uh, as the other presenter was presenting, I ran a quick illustration. That 60-year-old woman at Nationwide is going to get about 350000 of death benefit. But then that's all that's available for long-term care. We do not have the multiplier effect for long-term care. So she's going to get $350,000 of, of death benefit that she doesn't use it. No, somebody's getting 350, right? If she doesn't use it for long-term care, her kids or grandkids get 350 of death benefit. So basically, you can use it $7,000 a month for 50 months, 2% of the face amount per month for 50 months. And if her, if her home health care is, let's say, $4,000 a month, with, with an indemnity policy, she actually has two options with indemnity. With indemnity, she can say, you know what, just give me the 4,000, that's all I want, and now it's going to last, what, about 80, 90 months, right? 80, 85 months in terms of how long it will last. But I think the power with indemnity is she can take the entire 7000 4000 goes toward, towards her licensed home health care. She can take the other 3000 and literally she can do whatever she wants with it. She wants, to, she wants to hire her daughter to come in and cook and clean for her? Go ahead. Not an issue. Probably wouldn't be able to do that with a reimbursement. She's going to have a handyman come out and build her a wheelchair ramp. Go ahead. Heck, one night she has a dream about the number 17. And she decides the next day she's going to go to the casino and put, put 3000 on 17 at the roulette wheel. Go ahead. Her money. Um, I think the other I think advantage with indemnity riders is if you're working with high net worth individuals who want to buy this life insurance contract and throw it inside an irrevocable life insurance trust. With an indemnity rider, you can do this because there's no receipts going back and forth. There's no instance of ownership. Reimbursement policy, I don't believe you're going to be able to do that because with the receipts going back and forth, you have instance of ownership and it's not going to be able to be able to use inside of an island. Um, and then last but not least, we do have an international. We do pay internationally. Uh, for Nationwide, there is, there is no restriction on the international feature. I think Nationwide's philosophy has always been, we're going to pay this out anyways. What do we care? And we're, we're going to do the absolute minimum required. 
And so where I, where I think this works, I'm going to give you a couple sales ideas here. Where I think this works is one of the things you mentioned before was, was insurance reviews. That I, I do 15, 20 of those a year where how many here in the room, kind of a trick question, how many here would like to get free long-term care for their clients? Hopefully everyone, maybe. So we did a case, and like I said, we do 15 or 20 of these a year. The best one I remember from the last year or so, 60-year-old male <clears throat> has accumulated four old life insurance policies over the years. When you add them all up, he's got, was it three, it was 370 of death benefit, 86,000 of cash value, he's paying 350 a month in premium. And the advisor says, Pat, can you come out and do the point of sale meeting with me? Absolutely. We go out and we talk to him, and, and so myself and the advisor, husband and wife, and I asked him, the very first question I asked him, are you going to use this 86000 for something other than life insurance? Are you ever going to surrender these policies and go buy a boat or go on a nice vacation? Like, no, 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 we have other assets for that. This money is always going to stay in the life insurance contract. So I asked him, would you, would you like to see a different way of leveraging that money in a different kind of life insurance contract? He goes, sure, what do you got? So well, we have this, this no-lapse guaranteed UL, um, and we're going we're gonna to run an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So 86000 of cash value comes over to Nationwide, paying 350 a month in premiums. And I asked him, I said, is it okay to guarantee the death benefit at the age 105? Is that sufficient? He goes, sure, sure, that's fine. We run the illustration, the 370 of death benefit turns into 525. The entire 525 is available for long-term care for the exact same premium he's paying today. So as far as I'm concerned, I just got him free long-term care. It's not costing him one extra cent out of his pocket. And he looks at the illustration, and he look, we show it to him. What do you think his, his first reaction was? Oh. Sign me up, right? That was his, actually his second reaction. The second reaction is, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this sounds too good to be true, right? What, what's the catch? I said, you know what? You're right. There's always a catch. There's no free lunch in this world. Well, except for today, right? But no free lunch in this world. I said, the catch is, after about 15, 20 years, your cash value goes away. In all these no-lapse contracts of today, the cash value goes away, right? He said, and, and do you realize now why I asked him at the very beginning of the meeting, are you going to use that cash for anything else? I was setting him up, right? As soon as he said no, I didn't, it was a done deal as far as I was concerned. 15 minutes later, he's filling out an application. And... The advisor, was just sitting, the advisor was just sitting there with a big grin on her face. She didn't have to do anything. I did the wholesale for her. Um, I think the other area where, where I'm starting to see this long-term care rider used is um, just simple wealth transfer. So if you think about this, if you draw a circle around this building, you draw it mm, 30, maybe 40 miles around this building, in the next 15 to 20 years, there's hundreds of billions of dollars in play for wealth transfer, right? If this is not the best time to be in the life insurance game, I don't know when it is. If this is not one of the best areas in the country to be doing wealth transfer, I don't know where it is, right? And, and where the long-term care rider, I think, comes into play for wealth transfer. You have somebody who has 100000 uh, a woman in her 60s, you know, it could be this 60-year-old this woman that we were just talking about. She has 100000 <clears throat> sitting sitting in the bank. It's money for her kids or her grandkids. The 100000 like I said, turns into three fifty. They look at the no-lapse illustration, and they freak out. The no-lapse UL illustration, 15 years down the road, no cash value. They freak out. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm giving up access to my asset. What, what if I need this 100000 for an emergency? Fair enough, you're 63 years old, or you're 60 years old, what emergency are you thinking of? What's the emergency for a 60 year old woman? Well, you guys have to have a little more coffee, I think, this morning. <laughs> but, right, right. A lot of times they say medical, and, and, and that's what my mom said. I'm going through some of these sales ideas with my mom. My mom said, Well, Pat, medical. I said, Mom, what do you mean by that? She goes, Well, what if something happens to your dad? He's gone, something happens to me, and I have to have someone come in and take care of me. I said, Mom, that sounds a lot like long-term care. So when you can take the entire 350 and tell them the entire 350 is available for long-term care, just in case, 
right? You instantly overcome the objection. So I'm gonna, I have a, about 10 minutes left. Let me give you one more quick, couple more quick sales ideas, uh, sales idea and a success story, I should say. Um, I think part of the issue with life insurance is we, you can't talk about life insurance, right? You, a lot of people, you'd say life insurance. All right, just a little if music accompaniment. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of times we talk about life insurance and people, they just glaze over, right? And, and, and the other problem with life insurance is there's not a lot of what's in it for me, right? You see, the client says, what's in it for me? I've got to be six feet under, right? What's in it for me? So what I want to do is I want to provide a sales idea for you using the long-term care rider and our life insurance contract where we're going to provide a huge what's in it moment for your client. We're going to provide a huge what's in it moment for you, the advisor. <clears throat> so the question being, do any of you have clients probably in their 60s, maybe early 70s, with money sitting in CDs, money market, savings accounts, money sitting in cash, basically, right? And the money, they don't need it for a living, it's, it's basically legacy money. And so the question I would ask you, that money sitting in the CD, as the advisor, do you have access to that money in terms of investing it for the client? No, it's sitting in the CD. So what we're going to do, two sales for you, and we're going to provide a huge what's in it moment for your client. So we met with this woman, was it a couple years ago, 65-year-old woman. She was worth a million and a half to two million dollars. She has half a million sitting in a CD. Doesn't need it for income. She's got pension, Social Security, 401k, <clears throat> and it's legacy money. We go out, myself and the advisor go out, and we go to her. How would you like to leave that half million to your kids? But it's only going to cost you 35 to 40 cents on the dollar to do so. And so we got her, and she goes, well, that, that sounds really interesting. How do you do that? <clears throat> at that point in time, what are the very last two words you want to mention to her at that point in time? Life insurance. Right. People hear life insurance, and they turn into a zombie, right? It's, it's how to talk about life insurance without your clients realizing you're talking about life insurance. So I tell her, I've got this great alternative investment I want to tell you about. People hear the words alternative investment, and two things go through their head. Right? The first is, wow, that, that sounds pretty exciting. Right? I mean, I thought you had to be worth five, ten million dollars to get alternative investments. I thought you'd be working with some corner office guy in downtown San Francisco to get alternative investments. <clears throat> the other thing that goes through their head, and especially for her, half a million singing this CD, <clears throat> she's probably pretty conservative. She's probably thinking to herself, alternative investment, that sounds like hedge funds and derivatives and Bernie Madoff. And what I tell her is this alternative investment is 180 degrees opposite from any other alternative investment you've ever heard of. It's super conservative. Ironclad guarantees, right? Has its own internal rate of return, which is incredibly competitive for such a comp uh, conservative product. Sold by an A-rated company, Nationwide Insurance. It's not the XYZ hedge fund that's been around for three months. Heck, it's so flexible, you can use it early for long-term care, no penalties. And the woman looks at me and she goes, <clears throat> Pat, that, that sounds great. Did Nationwide come out with a new product that I'm not aware of? And so I look back at her and I said, well, I go, not really. I said, I asked her, I said, how was I introduced to you 30 minutes ago? She thinks about it for a few moments. This look comes over her face. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You tricked me. You're talking about life insurance. I didn't want to talk about life insurance. Is it not super conservative? Do we not have the guarantees that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago? Is Nationwide not an A-rated company? A mutual company, like you were saying earlier, a mutual company where, where our members come first, we're not driven by any bottom line, have to hit some earnings per share number every quarter? Can you not use it early for long-term care, right? Her, her internal rate of return, her internal rate of return, if she were to pass away at age 85, right, so we're not killing her off early, if she passes away at age 85, her internal rate of return, I think, was just a shade under 6% after tax. So I'll ask you, anyone in the room, is there a more conservative product than, than life insurance, or as conservative as life insurance, that's giving you a 6% after tax rate of return after 20 years? Can't do it. And, and then the last part is it costs her 175000 to buy the half million dollars of life insurance, right? The other thing I always make when I talk about alternative investments, 
<clears throat> life insurance is an alternative investment. And I know we have some annuities guys, I think, presenting a little bit later this morning, so I kind of make a joke at, at their expense. The annuity guys come into your office and say, hey, I have this great sales idea for half of your client's money. Right? All I'm looking for, 5 or 10%. I'm not greedy. 5 or 10%, that's it. So remember, she was worth a million and a half to two million. 175 <clears throat> is about 10%. So there's, there's your first sale. 175 buys her half a million dollars of life insurance. The entire half million is available for long-term care, just in case. So where's the second sale coming from that I promised you? And where's the huge what's in it moment for her? Where's the second sale coming from? How much was sitting in the CD? Half a million? How much did you spend on the life insurance? Did you not just free up 325000 for her to blow on herself? The five hundred k for the kids is done. You just freed up over 300000 for her to blow on herself. I tell people, if she's, if she's a widow, go and tell her to find a new boyfriend, right? 300000 And there's your second sale, right? <clears throat> I'm sure you all have ideas and ways to invest in their remaining 325000 so it's, it's, it's talking about life insurance without the clients realizing you're talking about life insurance. It's, it's obviously, it's, it's selling the benefits. So let me give you one last uh, success story. I think my job today is, is to get you maybe excited enough that it would be helpful for me to come out and talk with you when we have more time one-on-one. -on -one. Um, one of the great things about having as much windshield time as I have is I've got a thousand different sales ideas, right? And so I, I like to share some of those success stories I've had with other advisors. <clears throat> the best one I have is I met with a, a, an advisor in San Leandro last summer. I, I gave her a few, hey, do you have clients like this? Do you have clients like that? Gave her a few profiles to look for. Met with her again last fall. In December, we did a point of sale meeting with a couple of hers up in Portland, Oregon. And in January, we did a point of sale meeting with a couple of her, uh, a couple that she's working with in Berkeley. <clears throat> End of the day, four signed applications, eight hundred and fifty thousand in premium. And and once again, this is a woman who is in her mid fifties, just kind of doing her thing, middle of the road advisor. She's not sitting in some corner office, like I said, twenty floors up in San Francisco. She's so excited now that she called me a few weeks ago. Hey, Pat, I've got this other insurance review case I want to talk to you about. 75000 of life insurance, of, of cash value seeing this old life insurance contract. She is fired up and looking for all these opportunities in her book of business, right? And, and so it, it would, I would love to have that opportunity come out, meet with you for a few minutes, go through your book of business. Um, what can we do to help, uh, help, uh, help generate more sales? And maybe... in the, one nice little byproduct, maybe you could take some assets away from another advisor, right? If they're not talking about life insurance or long-term care. So, appreciate the time this morning. Thanks, everybody. Oh, before I forget, we do have a brochure that one of the back, at the back table just kind of walks you step-by-step step through kind of the long-term care process, sales process, if that's helpful. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate, yeah. appreciate it today. Um, I'm going to follow along, I think, with that uh, as well as we get the next presenter set up. Um, Policy reviews have become, I think, almost cliche in our industry. We talk about them all the time. However, most people still aren't doing them. I think part of the reason is is because they don't know what to do or how to do it often. And so, uh, you know, Pat mentions having uh, someone from one of the carriers or someone from our office come out and help you. We're more, more than happy to do that. But a couple of years ago, we actually uh, took the time to develop a turnkey policy review process. We call it policy assessment. And uh, we did it a little bit differently than, than most folks. Um, here in the state of California, we have something called an insurance analyst. And last I checked, there was only uh, 28 of them in the entire state. It's a special license that, that literally says that they can analyze policies and see how effective they are. Well, of the 28 that are licensed in the state, we have two of them in my office. And we actually built a program with them and uh, a CPA and attorney uh, that really is designed to take existing enforced policies we actually will act, go out and get the enforced ledgers for you. We have a, um, a two-page document that the client fills out. Uh, that One of the pages in the document is a, a release for us to be able to go get the enforced ledgers from whatever carriers they currently have policies with. We can go get that information and then we package it up and have our analyst and attorney and CPA look at the information, look at any supporting documentation that may go with it. We do a complete uh, review of all of the available products in the industry and find any... Uh, 
uh, possible solutions that might be a better fit for that client based on their current needs and objectives. L let me ask you this, and it's a trick question, which is uh, how many of your clients, 10 years after they bought their insurance, have the exact same need for the exact same insurance policy you sold them 10 years ago? And the, and the answer is probably zero. Um, although we often don't go back to those same clients and ask them about that insurance policy we sold them 10 years ago. So this is an easy way to do it. Um, the output of this policy review is actually about a 40 page uh, report that is designed, uh, it's packaged up and designed to be able to go to another CPA, attorney, financial advisor for them to be able to see the work that was done. Um, we've used this hundreds of times over the last three or four years and I can tell you that we've never had a single CPA or attorney dispute uh, the results of the review. We've had them sometimes suggest alternatives to what we suggested, but we've never had them say that yes, this was uh, indeed something that needed to be taken care of and dealt with. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity. What we're finding is that these reviews, even with minimal cash value in the policies, even with uh, policies that aren't particularly that old, you know, four, five, six years, that the average uh, sell, the average premium, uh, tends to, to hang around the $17,000 target commission uh, level, which is a nice, nice little payday for you as the advisor. Um, the work is done absolutely free of charge. We've actually looked at some comparable services out there where they charge as much as $2,000 to do this uh, same kind of work. We're doing it for free uh, with the assumption that uh, we can hopefully earn your business by doing it. So something to consider, and it goes, a lot, I think, right along with what Pat mentioned, which is policy reviews are a good, good thing, and, and there is now a turnkey solution you can use to make them easy. Um, with that, I believe that we have a Nicole Scher from North America up next. Hi, Nicole. How are you? Thank you for coming. Good morning. Thank you indeed for having me here. My name is Nicole Scher. I am with North American Company of Life and Health, although I have no idea why the word health is in the title of the company because we don't manufacture any health insurance and no disability insurance or nor long-term care insurance. Um, I live right over here in Alamo, and when I was in personal production, I gave uh, public seminars or met some of my best clients right here in these rooms in this um, facility. So, Which presentation okay. would you like me to? Um, smart money. It's in, right in the middle. Yep. There you go. So hopefully, in a brief amount of time today, I will be covering what someone mentioned. What's in it for me? So we'll talk about what's in it for the agents and also what's in it for the clients. Quick question, who's heard of North American? Who can spell North American? I'm kidding. Okay. We are truly North American. Um, our underwriting, case management, policy owner services, where they print the life insurance policies, that's located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Terrible weather. Very happy employees. <laughs> Terrible weather, very happy employees. Um, our sales development specialists and you at Penny Insurance or associated with Penny Insurance, you have your own dedicated internal marketer. His name is Chris Korf, K-O-R-F-E. He will work with you and the folks at Penny for case design, poli um, policy illustrations. We offer you Insmark as a part of our illustration software, looking at internal rates of return on life insurance, cash values, death benefit, all of that. He'll work with you on those. That, those folks are located in Fargo, North Dakota, where I understand you know, there are four seasons and one of them is flood. So that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. They have an annual flood when the snow melts. Our executives are located in Chicago, Illinois, and the corporate offices for North American and all of the annuity division are located in West Des Moines, Iowa. So again, I'm the lone person out here on the left coast over in Alamo. So truly North American. We are um, unique to the life insurance industry in that we are employee owned. The entire corporation is owned inside of an ESOP. So each and every person at North American is an employee owner. And you might be asking yourself, so what? How does that matter to me? And how ultimately does it matter to the policy owners? Well, first of all, we've been around since 1886. Very high ratings, A plus, A plus, Comdex of 92. But in addition to that, uh, we're taking a long-term view on the policies that we're manufacturing today and also on the growth of our business. We have excellent growth in business in great part due to associations or partnerships such as what we have with Penny. We've seen 14% growth on average 
over the last five years in life insurance sales against an industry on average that's down about 2%. And you can count on us to stick with renewal rates on annuities, and I won't be doing an annuity pre presentation today, um, and to stick with the policies that we have and treat our current policy owners as favorably or may more favorably, thank you, than the folks coming in the door. Compliance said hello. I'm going to do smart money to find some objectives of clients, life insurance as a solution, talking and uh, tips and talking points. We have 11 presentation kits that are available for you. This one happens to be on the smart money concept. Each one of the presentation kits is developed for the agent on one side and for the consumer on the other side. So we'll have a high level overview of the sales concept, maybe some worksheets for the agent, and then the same type of corresponding materials that you can leave behind with a client, consumer approved. In addition to that, most of the kits have also postcards that you can order. You may order postcards in any quantity that you want. They are consumer approved postcards. Then what would go on the postcard is your contact information. So if they want to give you a call back or want to contact you, it'll have your name, phone number, email address, whatever you want to put on that postcard, okay? With smart money, we want to make these assets available. Thank you. And what, what thanks, but you can go forward, that's right. Um, what, we, what might we be looking at? Again, this is not a new concept. We are going to purposefully, excuse me, create a modified endowment contract. Now, almost all of the sales that we do at North American, 95% or more, are not modified endowment contracts. But in this sales idea, we're going to create a modified endowment contract purposefully. And we're going to say, so what? It's a modified endowment contract. It'll be taxed if they withdraw money. It'll be taxed exactly the way that an, an annuity would be. Right? So we're going to look at CDs, annuities, money market accounts, savings accounts, or a recent windfall or inheritance. I know um, our previous speakers were talking about 0.24%. I've got money in Bank of America. I'm pretty sure I'm going to start paying them to have my money there. I know it's at less than half a percent. So what are the objectives here for most clients? Yeah, we want to leave some money for our heirs. We want to have a tax-free delivery of a death benefit during those working years and the state building for later years, access to those funds for an emergency, for unexpected needs, future unidentified needs, and we want to earn a competitive rate of return. I know that my friends are going to come up here and talk about annuities, and Justin already knows this. I've sold, personally, billions of dollars worth of annuities. I think they are a fantastic asset for accumulating wealth. Terrible at transferring wealth, and in addition to that, today there are real big challenges on earning a competitive rate of return within an annuity. Thank you. So here's the life insurance solution. Rapid builder and putting the waiver of surrender rider onto the policy. When I add a waiver of surrender rider to, this happens to be on an indexed universal life chassis, when I add the waiver of surrender rider, I am creating 100% available cash. So what happens for the agent? What happens to the commissions? I'll address that up front. The, the commissions level stays the same. Street level commission on this is 90 points, but the target premium is reduced by about 38%. This is a very high target life insurance policy by adding the waiver of surrender rider on there, I make all of the cash available and I reduce the target by about 38%. We're also going to create this as a cash value accumulation test life insurance policy. We're creating a modified endowment contract. We're stuffing as much cash into this policy as we can and not wanting to threaten the insurance corridor because we still want to provide a death benefit that's delivered to those beneficiaries <coughs> should this person die too soon. We want to deliver that death benefit on a tax-free basis. Outside of the great state of California, the chronic illness accelerated death benefit rider is available. It's not a long-term care rider. We've heard two descriptions of long-term care riders. This is a chronic illness accelerated death benefit rider. 
If you have clients outside of California, come and see me. We'll go through a little exercise and I'll explain it to you. It is indemnity. They can get up to 24% of the original death benefit per year, get a check for it once a year, do whatever they want with the money. Okay, some th considerations, you know, compliance was at the front of this, right? We wanna consider those COIs. The life may not be guaranteed against a loss of principal because there are costs of insurance coming out, especially in that first year. The amount, if the client cashes it in, may be less than what they put into the policy. Additional benefit premiums may be necessary to maintain a specific um, death benefit. And there are some tax ramifications with creating a modified endowment contract. We're creating it on purpose. Thank you. All right, no, it's hard to and difficult to read. And I apologize, sir, your name, please? Michael. Michael, Michael. Here we go, he's the, the example, not Michael. He's younger than this. But the example is a 55-year-old. It says preferred, that's not best class, it's preferred. This is fully underwritten life insurance. We've got the waiver of surrender rider on there. The selection was S&P 500. North American has more indices available than any of the carriers. That's not to create confusion, it's to give more options. But we've got 100% in the S&P. We have three columns here, 3%, 3%, and 7.5. The maximum we will permit anyone to illustrate is 8.3%. And I have the histories up here of what the indices have paid and what North American has paid for that index every year that we've had the policies in force. But this is showing a non-guaranteed of seven and a half. I want to go to the worst case column here. $200,000 went into this policy, and Michael's going to tell us, at 3% interest rate and the highest possible COI for per the policy every single year. In other words, North American goes back to the great state of California or wherever this was illustrated. We go back to each one of the states and refile every year to raise our COIs, every single year. At 3%, Michael, can you tell me what the cash value is at the end of the first year? There's a lot of nines in there. Yeah, <laughs> 199942. So worst case scenario, $200,000 went in. Not even possible, but worst case scenario, they have $199,942. So they're down about $60 at the end of the year if they cash this in. There is no surrender penalty. We place the waiver of surrender rider on there. Without the waiver of surrender rider, by the way, it's a 14 year surrender schedule. At 3%, but current COIs, and North American has never changed a COI on a policy ever in our history since 1886, but at 3% in current COIs, at the end of the year, they've got 202,000 of cash in there, and the death benefit started out at 500,000. If this performs anywhere near what we think it will, we have assumed a 7.5% interest rate, then we're looking at $211,000 worth of cash for that client. So if the client takes out $11,000, that's an accumulation of interest, it's a modified endowment contract, they would need to pay taxes on that. Okay? Before for me? Sure. We have, yeah. So from a kind of asset protection, bankruptcy planning sort of pers perspective, since this cash value is all available, um, are they still generally allow the protection of the bankruptcy code? Okay, so no, it's not subject to bankruptcy, correct. So Nobody can protected. get at these funds, right. Okay. Um, death benefit is a little over $500,000. That would be delivered to those beneficiaries income tax free if they should die too soon and it's available all years. There's access to that cash value that's available all years. I'm gonna tell you a secret, we all know it, but we always forget it. More than 90% of the people, life insurance or annuities, unless they're required under a mandatory required distribution or required mandatory di distribution, whichever way you want to phrase it, unless they're required to take money out, 90% of this money is always going to stay there. But we've overcome all of those objections. What if I need to get at my money? And outside of California, there's also that chronic illness accelerated death benefit 
that's provided off of the $508,000, okay? Thanks. There's a waiver of surrender. We've added this to the policy. If you don't click it and ask for it, then you'll have that 14-year surrender schedule. The target premium will be 38% higher, but you won't create that instant pot of cash for the claim. Yes. Limited exposure to loss, so could it go down in value? It could. If we charge the highest possible COIs year after year, and again, that means we've got to go back to the state and refile to increase the COIs within the policy every single year. And we've created this as a modified endowment contract. We are purposefully getting a low death benefit with a high cash value policy. That's what we designed to do. We have the chronic illness, thank you, accelerated death benefit outside of the state. One more. And then these are the in some one of the internal rates of return reports that we can generate for you and for the client. He was 55 years old, put in 200,000. There's your net surrender cash value. And here are those internal rates of return. Here's also the death benefit, and here's the internal rate of return on the death benefit. So again, going out to year 30, that client will be 85 years old. This policy will be around forever, you know, out to age 120 or 121. But going out to year 30, 6.17% is their internal rate of return on the cash value and about 7% or 6.9% is that internal rate of return on the death benefit. Thank you. We have competitive returns. We've got competitive returns short term and long term. Thank you. Did we meet those objectives? I think so. We want to leave funds behind to the next generation, protect during those working years, build an estate for later. Do they have access to the funds? Yes, they do. And is there a competitive rate of return possible? Instead of illustrating at 3%, we can illustrate much higher. The cap on the product is 13%. It's annual selection, annual reset, and they can access the funds on a modified endowment contract. We're going to recommend that they access any funds they want to take out through withdrawals. They'll be treated just like it would with an annuity, but we have that tax-free death benefit on the other side. Okay, there's a single premium sales are very common. We are created in a modified endowment contract. This is a cash value accumulation test um, policy. It can be issued as a guideline premium test policy. More than 97% of all life insurance policies that are issued by all of the carriers are created as guideline premium test policies. Here, we're selecting CVAT because we can put more money into that policy and not threaten the insurance corridor. So we're adding on that waiver of surrender, giving early access, and by the way, when you add the waiver of surrender rider to the rapid builder product, it comes along with a table three to standard table shape. So those folks who have diabetes that's controlled, or maybe they're a little short for their current weight, or those types of impairments, they would be issued with a standard policy, okay? If your client or you as the advisor don't want anything to do with an index, we have a separate product, that's the custom guarantee, I'm sorry, custom growth CV. It's on a fixed chassis instead of an index chassis. Uh, the big difference there is that the interest rate that would accumulate on the policy is going to be somewhere around 4% as opposed to, remember, we were showing a 7.5% on the index product. Okay, thank you. And we can take a look at some alternative illustrations. What if we want to lower that face amount? Instead of 500000 in the original illustration, we cut this down to 250000 then that cash of death benefit, then that cash is going to grow a little more quickly. And where this illustration shows the custom growth CV, which is on a fixed <coughs> chassis with the waiver surrender rider, same table shave applies, and same 38% reduction in target. Mission structure stays the same, the target premium comes down. Thank you. So how do you know? Ages 50 to 80, 
have a death benefit need, have some funds in a certificate of deposit, money market, annuity, windfall, and they desire access to that cash value. Thank you. There's a sales support number. Your individual representative is Chris Korf, K-O-R-F-E, so the um, email address would be ccorf at nicola.com, and that'll get you directly to Chris, and he can run illustrations and work with you, okay? At the beginning, the folks here at Penny <coughs> mentioned helping you find your next insurance sale. What I'll do is I'll make sure I get out to each one of you. It's on that thumb drive as well. What we've begun doing is working with agents in smaller groups and pointing out to you on every life insurance policy application that you take, whether it's GenWorth or Nationwide. By the way, I have two Nationwide policies myself. Okay, um, Whether it's GenWorth or Nationwide or any of the carriers, as you're taking that life insurance application, we want to show you a way to collect nine names. Just by taking the life insurance application, you might not talk to them during that initial meeting, but on follow-up phone calls, as the policy is being underwritten, or when you go to policy delivery, they would be names that you could talk with that client. To number one, get in warm introductions to your next um, potential client. Number two, set up your next sale. And number three, add a lot more value to the experience as well. How much do I have a minute or two? Something like that? Okay, so if I, if I just use one example, um, the temporary insurance agreement. Not very many of us pay a lot of attention to that temporary insurance agreement. We're taking a check, we're finding coverage for that client at that moment in time. Everyone has their own specific amount of coverage that can be bound. And uh, parameters with that temporary insurance agreement. There are names that go on there. There's also a beneficiary on the life insurance policy. What questions are we asking about that beneficiary? How much coverage do they have in force? It's right on the life insurance policy in most cases. Okay. There's all, a list of riders on life insurance applications. Children's riders, other types of riders. We can mention them and set that expectation that when we return to deliver the policy or on the next phone call, we'll be talking about additional uh, features and benefits of life insurance. My favorite doesn't really apply to California, but I'll use the example anyway. Um, the first page of our life insurance application outside of California is that chronic illness accelerated death benefit rider. That's the first page of the life insurance application. Comes with the policy, no additional charge, no additional morbidity underwriting. On that page, it talks about two out of six activities of daily living. We understand what they are, the customers don't, but it lists it right there for them. If you can't do these things, and a doctor says you can't, you, can, you or your family representative can access a portion of that death benefit. It has a space right there. Who's the doctor that would make this decision because we have to have, all of us, we have to have a letter from a doctor, don't we? Every carrier needs a letter from a doctor. So there's a space right there. Who's that doctor? Guess what? The doctor's name is on their personal device, their phone or what have you. So you can get the doctor's name and their phone number. Much, much more importantly in my estimation, who would be the person that would be making decisions about your level of care? Who would that person be? So it could be their spouse, in my case it'll be Alan, but it could also be their oldest child or their brother-in-law or someone outside of that. So it gives a space for that information, who that person is, their phone number, and I would be gathering all of that by the time you finish that one single front page of a life insurance application, if three or four names of people. And we're negligent in not taking down their contact. So I would submit to you, as you're taking each life insurance application, gather that information as well. So, additional questions you think I can answer or I might be able to answer for you regarding North American company? Okay. We manufacture three things, life insurance, annuities, and retirement plans. That's all we do. We don't manufacture anything outside of that, so very specialized in our delivery. 
This year we will more than likely, through fine organizations as, uh, such as Penny, write about $40 million in No Lapse Universal Life. We'll write about $40 million in Indexed Universal Life. So folks are buying them, okay? And in addition to that, about $20 million in term insurance. So we're in the enviable position that um, less than about 20% of our overall sales are term insurance, both by policy count and by premium. Yeah? Are your term insurance policies convertible to all these products? Yeah. The, the question was, what are the term insurance policies convertible to? And the answer is, any of our per permanent products throughout the level paying period of the term insurance. So if it's 10 year level term, it can, can be converted without evidence of insurability to any one of our permanent policies. If it's during 10 years, if it's 15 year, 20 year, 30 year. No matter age? Um, it's a maximum of, I wanna say, I can use my cheat sheet. It's a maximum of 74, but never less than five years. So if you have a 72 year old that purchased a 10 year level term, they would still be able to convert it during that five-year period. But I'll double check and, and make sure I give you the correct answer at lunch. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Angie. Our last one, I know. Eric over here. You're going you're gonna to wow, so I hope. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> I don't have anything like that. Um, are you going to use a presentation? Are you going to use that? Got it. Yes. Um, so, one one quick thing to add, I guess, to, to this is is collecting information. Um, you know, a lot of us, I think, have forgotten that that's part of our job sometimes. And so, um, one of the things I, I will point out is uh, I, don't, I don't know if any of you have done or used our Easy Life uh, sales platform, which is our electronic uh, application process that we created about seven years ago. Um, basically, there's a, a one-page application for all carriers that we use. So it doesn't matter if it's North American or Genworth or ING or Nationwide. Uh, we use the same one-page uh, application collection form for all carriers uh, for all life insurance products, permanent term, um, even hybrid VULs. It doesn't matter. Um, and so that, that's something that you may want to take a look at, Nikel, or uh, can definitely answer any questions you have on that if you have anything specific. The one thing about that, though, that it does is because we've limited the amount of information that you need to collect to do the life insurance application, it allows you to go get back to what we're supposed to be doing, which is collecting information in a fact-finding environment uh, to identify other sales opportunities and to come up with, uh, again, this list of names that Nicole mentioned or to identify maybe policies that uh, could potentially be reviewed uh, when you're going through the, the collection of data. So I would encourage you to, to look at some, some time-saving uh, efforts whether it's our Easy Life platform or some other uh, electronic signature platforms that are going to help you spend time doing what's important, which is talking to your clients about what their needs are and what their objectives are long term. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric uh, from ING. Thanks Appreciate good. it. Thanks very much. Oh, got yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Thank you all for having me this morning. I know I'm clean up before uh, the real money comes in the room. We'll see you guys. So. Um, do you know what that is? 401k. <laughs> <laughs> it's retirement account. What is it? It's my money that the government's going to take a big chunk of later. <laughs> Specifically, what is it? Government tax code. Thank you. This is tax code. Okay? What's that? IRC code. It's tax code. Okay. Here's what's funny. I love the I love the earlier the what's in it for me. Okay. I love that question. You know, when I first started in, in this business 25 years ago, I came in kind of backwards. I started working for one of the largest coaling consulting shops in the country. So I didn't learn from the career side and sitting at the table and day this. I came in backwards. I mean, my first meeting, I, I talked about key man. I freaked. I was going to have a hard time to die. I didn't know what it was. Later, found out to my embarrassment of these terms. Oh, okay. But I can sit and you know, explain P&L impacts of uh, buying a corporate life insurance policy to a CFO of a Fortune 100 company all day long. No big deal. So at that time, I would always you know, make up something fancy. I'd go to a room like this, what are you doing? Well, I'm an executive manager, consultant. 
You could see in their face, they're like, what the hell did you just say? So it took me a while to grow into my skin. And I love it now, because when somebody asks me, what, I, what do I do? What do you do, Eric? I sell that insurance. Run? Good. Stay and talk? You're probably interested in something. So what's in it for me? Well, here's what's funny. Because most people out there, they know this is a retirement plan. They know this is tax cut. And defi what defines all of this, OK? Here's where our job lies, right here, okay? is explaining this. Life insurance is magical, guys. Now, I don't have any of the cool stuff that my counterparts from North American, Nationwide, or um, Jim, or thank you, have. I, we don't have any link benefits on that. So in that instance, we're the slow group, OK? We're kind of the slow group. But we're big in accumulation and protection, all right? The message really is you need to protect what you have, your house, your income, whatever it is, okay? And you need to accumulate for what you're going to need, okay? And so what we need to do in our industry is do a better job of explaining what this is. This is the definition of life insurance, okay? This is really what it is. So how many of you work with small business owners? Good market, isn't it? Okay, there's a lot of them, all right? What is top of mind with small business owners right now? Taxes? Do you agree? And maybe Obamacare. 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 Okay. And maybe saving. Okay. Providing benefits, saving. Okay. So, our cell phone life and retirement solar. This is not free government money. The first time I started coming up here to see Mr. Penny here, um, I fly to San Jose, see some customers here, and drive whatever. The, there's a lot of 80 freeways up here. I'm from Southern California. Okay. <laughs> We have simple, for simple mind like me, 10, 5, 4, 5. Small numbers, easy for my little brain to remember. So when I was on one of these 80s, and I'm driving along, and I see the big sign, cylinder, laughing my rear off. And this is hysterical. There's my money as I'm going by. My money. This isn't free government money, OK? So solar is really a new way of looking at people and spin it forward like that way. A new opportunity to help clients save more money, OK? And why? Look at these stats. I'm not going to read them to you. But the first one's pretty astounding. This is Lindbergh. This is our organization that we all belong to. Okay, so we didn't just make this up. You know, Brad and I went this morning while we were having breakfast on the way over here from the courtyard. All right? Look at the second one. Half of Americans die from no money. That's Wall Street Journal last August. That's frightening. You know, the next one. What a fan of reading to people. I figure you could all read or use you wouldn't be in this business. How about the last one? Saving for retirement is number one finance goal. It is supporting to research done by ING Retirement Institute in conjunction with Boston Consulting Group. We have three areas in, in ING, just real quick. We have retirement services, we have insurance division, which is Brad and I, and we also have employee benefits in there. And then we have an institutional investment management. Okay? Our retirement services is second only to TA Craft in size. So Kind of get it, you know what we're doing. Sorry, I'm going to do my best Marco Rubio here while I'm uh, doing my filibuster. It's going to make. Okay, so next one, please. So, what, what is this all about? Okay, it's about this. Retirement security isn't about your assets. You can have all the assets in the world, fine homes, yachts, and all that. Can you spend that? No, it's about what you can spend, isn't it? Okay, next one, please. Thank you. So, we all know a basic concept, don't we? when we're talking about saving and investing. Wouldn't that be diversification? You have bonds, you have stocks, precious metals, real estate, yes? Okay. But what our friends, our cousins, the other side of the financial services industry called Wall Street, don't really talk too much about is tax diversity. Okay? Because we have there's just three places your money's gonna be taxable tax, uh, capital gains, tax deferred or non tax that's, that's, that's it. This is it. Guys, my dear friend, old lady, okay? That's it. So, what are you going to do? Are taxes going up or down? Uh, right. Have you taken a peek at the new budget? It's just a wish list. We get this. Okay, it's a wish list. But sometimes these things kind of have a mysterious way of going in the back door. How about like the $3 million cap on contributions or tax deferred growth, rather, on qualified plans. That would suck. How about taking the current fiscal cliff rescue of the five and a quarter, five and a half million dollar exemption, dropping that back down to one. 
That's in there. That's in there. Okay, next one, please. So, so what would you think would be, if I would say the ideal retirement plan would have these three attributes, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Problem is, right now, you can only get two of the three at a time, can't you? The first two would be qualified plans. 403B, 401K, IRAs. Yes? The second two would be great things like Roth IRA, Roth 401K, life insurance. Right? Pretty good stuff. That's really just simple there. So what happens what happens if you're in a traditional type of plan up here, this right here, and you die when you're saving? Okay? You and your you and your wife, spouse, whatever it is, we're just saying, okay, we, we get we're gonna save every month. We're gonna put dollars in. And I die before retirement. What happened to my retirement plan with my spouse? It's broken. Because the gold, the pot of gold with the little leprechauns standing next to it, it was dependent on two people putting in the money. Okay? And people say life insurance is expensive. That's why they don't want to talk about life insurance. Again, but what's in it for me? What's in it for me is all the beautiful things about life insurance. Tax, deferred growth, tax-free income, tax-free death benefit. Okay? So, pretty crazy. I want to talk about two things in the solar market. I don't think I'm going to have time for both, so we're going to hit primarily just on the 401k look-alike using our solar insurance arrangement. Okay? You work with small business owners. You all said that. Okay? That's a great business opportunity. Here's the easy way to walk into and talk to a customer about the support what they look like. Because it's different from all the things you see up here, okay? It's not the traditional retirement plans, it's tax-free income, we're, not, we're taxing you know, the seed instead of the crop, this is beautiful, we get that. Misconceptions of traditional retirement plans, what are those? You're only gonna need 60 to 70% of your retirement income when you retire? That's a joke. What is it in your lives out here? Anything, think personally right now. What expenses, activities, currently make up 60, 60 to 70% or 30 to 40% of your earning that you're willing to give up? Probably nothing. Taxes. Well, taxes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> taxes, okay. Uh, how about, I, I, love, I, I, I love that, um, you know, oh, don't worry, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. You're fired. No, you're not going to be a lower tax bracket. That's insane. Okay? But if you are, hey, good luck. Why do you want to roll the dice with that? So let's talk about the 401k. I'd like to go one more. Okay. So you could walk into a business owner and I can say, Ryan, I have a plan for your key employees and you. Okay? But before I even get there, I just want to ask a couple questions. Do you have a 401k for your employees? It's going to be yes or no. I don't really care whether the answer is yes or no. If it's yes, great. Next question. Are you able to put the maximum amount in? Maybe not. Probably not. Do you have any other key employees that come up to you and say, hey, I love this forum, okay, man, and everything you're doing for me is great around here, but I'd like to say more. What else is there? They're like, nothing else, man. Take your check and go swap. Call my guy, Dietrich. See that on TV? Call them. Okay? Save on your own. There's nothing else. Okay? I could have you walk into a customer and say, I've got a plan. It's no cost to you. Zero cost, no administration, no record keeping. All contributions are tax deductible. Why? Because they're con all contributions are compensation. Is compensation deductible to a business owner? Yep. Always. Gap accounting, okay, it falls into the first category that a business owner is able to deduct. S, G, and A, salary, general, and administrative. Okay? Basic accounting lesson for you, one on one. All right? All, con all contributions are deductible. Our compensation is therefore deductible. So, Ryan could offer this plan to me and say, you know, Eric, I don't care if you go buy lipstick, lollipops, suits, go on vacation, buy a new car, or life insurance. I'm paying you salary, commission, bonus, whatever it is, combination thereof. I get to deduct it. Have fun. Do your thing, man. Okay? That's it. All right? Who could participate? Anybody and everybody. You don't have to offer this to anybody but one person. You can offer it to everybody. This is life insurance, gentlemen. Okay. This is not a qualified plan. So what, what is the magic of this? What makes this work? You see, if the, if the, if the ideal plan had pre-tax or equivalent contributions, tax-deferred growth, tax-free income, that's what the solar plan does. Okay? 
through the uniqueness of what we call a tax restoration loan. So, you understand how people, W-2 employees get paid, right? I'm a terrible artist. If Nicole really liked me, she'd be my artist. <laughs> okay, let's just play, that's your check. Okay, Joe over here, and you've got dollars, All right? That's your paycheck for your W-2. Do you spend this, or do you spend what's down in here? The bottom. Right, this is what you get. This is fantasy, and this is reality. So let's pretend for a minute that the fantasy was, I work again for Ryan, and Ryan pays me a $20,000 bonus this Friday, okay? It's deductible to him, whether I go buy a new car, new suit, go on vacation, do whatever, okay? Go to the bar for a week in Vegas. It's deductible. But if I'm in 30% tax bracket, do I get $20,000? I get 14. 6,000 was sucked out through withholding. Yes, out of my check, I get 14. Hey, not bad, thanks boss. Appreciate the 14 Gs. <laughs> I'll see you in a week. That's cool. So what we would say is, okay, well, here. You can take your bonus, your compensation, your salary, whatever it is, all right? You're gonna get that, but you're really getting 14. You're going to go ahead and put your 14 into our Global Choice Index product, all right? You've already paid through withholding $6,000 in taxes. That's 30% of $20,000, okay? We're gonna give you back, day one, $6,000 tax restoration loan, so now your premium is 20, okay? Yes, there's a cost for this. I think Pat, you said earlier, enough free lunch or something like that, okay? This is thanks to everybody over here, all right? There is it, okay? So there's a contractual guaranteed cost of 6% for that loan paying yourself back, and it's a participating loan, meaning that the entire $20,000, your $14,000, the $6,000 we gave you to restore the taxes you lost, the tax man, it's working in the index product plan, looking forward to keep flying through this. So, here's a summary, snapshot of analysis and illustration. Our illustrations are long because of compliance, illustration. All the things that are written by lawyers for lawyers to understand. Hopefully keep us all out of trouble, okay? But in the first eight pages of all of our concepts that we have at IAG, we try and bring it down to Dick and Jane, for a fifth grader, what's the summary of all this? Don't speak to me in your insurance language. Speak to me what's meaningful to me in my own plain English. So what this is saying is that if you did that, 45 to 65, okay, put your 14,000 in, we restored the taxes you paid every year at six grand, all right? be able to take out a million two, call it a million three, for 20 years in retirement, okay? We started day one with the death benefit of 438. Again, what's in it for me was this 7702. Life insurance provides this for you, okay? As you see in a traditional retirement plan, husband dies, wife dies before retirement, what do they get, who knows? Whatever the account's worth on the day that the person died. What does that, what does that mean? I don't know, it's a circular conversation. Life insurance, hey, there's a death benefit day one. Okay? And most people talk about costs and everything. Again, Wall Street likes to pick on us and say, oh, life insurance is expensive. Oh, so they're no-load funds. All right, right? Anybody ever looked at those? You know, the no-load funds have an average, or they range anywhere, not average, range from 100 basis points to 450 basis points. Do you think these guys on Wall Street work for free? No. So fees in life insurance are based on what? Premium or death benefit? Death benefit, cost of insurance, mortality, okay, DAC taxes, state taxes, all of that, right? Based on the death benefit. Well, I don't care if it's North American, Genworth, Nationwide, anybody else, okay? Our fees in our world, ladies and gentlemen, this just tip to argue that back to the consumers, are the average one, one and a, maybe one and a quarter percent. Am I right? Right. Okay, and people say we're expensive. The last little thing, you know, on that little note there, nothing of passion at all. When was the last time the insurance industry brought the world economy to its knees? Enough said. Next slide, please. <laughs> so here's how it looks. So Ryan gave me over 20 years $400,000 in bonuses, commission, whatever it was. He liked me, okay? I didn't swear too much. I combed my hair, I showered, all right? He got to deduct it. Whether, again, no matter what I did with the money, he got to deduct it. Corporate tax rate, penny is assumed it. 34% tax, 136, 264. I know, right? It's just, this is fantasy. It's still fantasy, okay? We're 
We're still a little, we're a little farther north from Disneyland, but it's still fancy. Okay? I got 400000 I had to pay Cumulative 120 I actually gave you back 120 so my total premium was 400000 I had no cost out of pocket, 64000 a year approximately, in retirement income for 20 years. I can run this for 25, 30, 35, 40. However long, you know, if I think I'm going to live a long time, then fine, illustrate it that way. So let's take a look at how this really looks. I wanted to show you this piece so that you don't think I'm just making this stuff up in a desperate attempt to try and, you know, stand up and look good amongst my esteemed colleagues this morning. This is the actual form that provides this loan. Let's go to the next slide because I'm going to blow it up. There. So, I get 14000 after tax, yes? I ask for the $6,000 loan, day one. Tax restoration, what's my total premium? 14 or 20? 20. 20, thank you. Next slide, please. Let's look at it. It's a marketing piece on this. It explains it. Dick and Jane, steps one through five. Now let's compare. Please. Okay, so the left side was what our industry likes to call, I can't say this strikes me, that's overfunded IUL. That makes sense to all of us, but outside this door, if you want to talk to one of these golfers out here and said overfunded IUL, I'm not sure if they were thinking you were going to give them an exam of some sort or whatever. It, sound, it doesn't sound appealing. Okay? So at ING, we just call it retirement extra or whatever. But again, if I took my 14000 because it's my money, I worked for it, paid my taxes, and I threw it in a life insurance policy, yay, 280000 in it, IRR, my cash value, 65 is 513. Okay? I get distributions of 55, 757. 20 years. It's a good deal. Okay? It's like a Roth IRA, but better. No limits, all that great stuff, plus death benefit. Okay? We, we get that, right? I'm, I'm not telling anybody anything new, right? And what if we do this solar? 14000 still comes from me. My contributions are still 280 I get 6000 coming in. Tax restoration loans every single year. All right? 400000 was my premium. IRRs and cash go up. My Distributions go up 22 percent from 55 to 68 thousand. All right. Now I know no one pays attention, but to any of this, and we're all doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. So please don't look at the last row on there. For doing something good for your client, providing them something new and unique in the market, pre-tax contributions or equivalent, tax-deferred growth, tax-free income, along with a nice death benefit, you got a 43 percent raise of doing this versus not doing it. I know that's terrible. We don't want to talk about comp. Next slide. So let's just play pretend again. I make two hundred thousand dollars a year working for Ryan. Okay, and because he likes me, we're going to assume I get a four percent annual increase. Okay, in raises. That's wonderful. Okay, great. Because I do my job, I show up on time. But he says, you know what, Eric? Tell you what, we have this plan, and every year that you meet your goal, whatever your goal is. Sweeping the floors, cleaning the bathroom, or selling more life insurance. Whatever that goal is, you need it. I'm going to pay your interest on your policy for your tax restoration. Okay? So over 20 years, Brian's paid me 200000 minus 20, 4% annual increase, $5.9 million. Don't choke, Brian. It's not that bad. Okay? $5.9 million. This is simple math. You should calculate this out. He paid my interest for 20 years. 6% was 84961 Call it 85000 that was a total of 1.43% of the total company already paid. Is that an expensive benefit? Is 1.43% expensive? No. It's not. How am I doing on time? Okay. Two, three minutes? Yeah. All right, so let's go. I want to go down here. The most important thing. All right. We all know accumulation sales are fantastic. People need to save more. We get that, don't we? And it's a big opportunity for us. And approaching business owners with the solar concept is like fishing in a barrel. It's really easy. Okay? But what is the challenge and the problem we have as professionals with illustrations for accumulation? What actually happens? As soon as you hit print, it doesn't matter anymore, does it? I don't care whether you illustrate 2% or 50%. Is that really going to happen year by year? No. So what's going to happen? The biggest issue, the biggest risk to any accumulation cell, UL, IUL, or VUL, if you're still selling VUL, okay, is the illustration that you ran for your client that they you they agreed on 
It's not going to be that perfect. It's not going to just continue to grow. You're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. Okay? So what's the solution? We have a team, a dedicated group of people. It's called the concierge team. And they are here to do nothing but service our index policy holders. There's seven of them on the team. And they're close to Nicole's people. One stayed up. Might not work. Also, fabulous people. Don't know why they live there. Every one of them. They can't seem to, you can't seem to pull them away from the place. They, they, they like them. Okay, good for you. Um, well, I don't know. Of course, you can probably you can even also make like, you know, I think 50 grand a year working at McDonald's right now because there's no, no unemployment. So it's pretty good. Anyway, what does this concierge team do? It protects the client from the cell. You sell an accumulation policy today to somebody that's 40 or 50 or 55, that's another 40 plus years, maybe 30 if they're only 50, okay? Are you going to be in business in 30 to 40 years from now? Maybe, maybe not. Who's going to take care of that client? Left on their own devices, what's going to happen? You see, I retired, okay? Old Billy Ray Tebow retires. And I talked to Mom. I said, Mama, didn't we buy some damn life insurance policy from that anything? Yeah. Well, get it for me. So I look at it. Oh, look at it. I can take 50 grand a year out of this deal. Call him up. She calls him up and gives me my money. Oh, this is a good deal. No taxes. Does it every year. About year 10, she goes back in the sitting room and says, nah, sorry, baby. There's no more money. Okay. No problem. I guess it's like the Schwab account and everything else. We spent it. That fun. There's, there's still more money elsewhere. Turn the page, please. Text. Phantom income. Phantom income. No one was there to help me manage my distributions from this policy. Because I didn't get a straight six, seven, eight, whatever percent return every single year, did I? No, that's not reality. But my illustration said that. I don't know. I'm I'm the American public. I'm not an expert in this business. Policy life, take a phantom income. Take a nice tax bill. See, this group of seven people are there and dedicated to do nothing but service our index policy. Day one, when you buy an ING index policy, you get two letters. You get hugs and kisses from our CEO. Most people make airplanes. I love the guy to death and throw those around. The room, okay? The second letter that, that the client gets, and the agent gets as well, welcome to the concierge team. This is what we do. We're here to ask, help you service your client. To the client, says we're here to answer any questions about your policy. You want premium changes, different funding patterns, whatever you need to do, we're good to go. Next page, please. Okay? We've already talked about this. Next page. And so each year, one month prior to policy anniversary, your client and you as the agent get a letter reminding you. If you have any questions on your policy, you'd like to see any changes to your policy, want to know how your policy is actually performing, please call us. Toll free number. You're not going to press one for Taiwan, three for, you know, Galapagos Islands or wherever the hell it is these days. Okay, you're going to talk to real people. They do talk a little strange. They do have accents. You know, hey, dear, don't you know? Okay. But they are speaking English, which is nice. Okay. So, and every year, you can do a resolve. And when it comes time, the most important time, most important time is distribution, isn't it? So they're going to say, okay, well, here's your asshole illustration. They're pulling that out and say, okay, yep, yep. Well, here's actually, here's your reality. And based on this, yes, maybe you can't do it. Good. Here you go. Call us next year. Call us next year. Performance was down. Hmm. Maybe it's 40, 35. Okay? But you're never going to have a phantom income tax bill. Okay? You're going to end up averaging more income over the long period than saying, take a long period, blindly take my 50 grand a year, and then I get a nice tax bill for three, four, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. That's going to leave a mark. So, any questions? I'm sorry if I can't. Did I just blow you away? Did you just be like, wow, this is crazy? Yes? Uh, relative to the time period, um, I think your illustration showed 20 years. I mean, is that is that? That's just an example. You do 25. Most of the time, we run the illustrations to age 100. If you think you're going to live that long, I mean, that, that, it doesn't matter. But relative to the contribution period. Yeah. Well, minimum minimum, you want to you want to do this at least five to seven years, and you want to always. I don't care whether it's our product, whether it's North American's product. This is they've got a great product too. Okay. I know General's going to come out with a great product. Nationwide's got a good index product. I don't care whose product you choose, ladies and gentlemen. You can never minimally fund this. This is not a guaranteed death benefit sale. You will hose your clients every time. 
Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. This has to be right at the MEC limit. You must overfund. And why do you do that? Because we're going to get zeros, aren't we? Or whatever your floor is at the carry. We happen to be a zero, okay? If you get zeros, you've got cushion against that. If you just fund a target or right under, you know, uh, you're going to blow apart at the seams. So you must always fund. And minimum five to seven years, okay? You can go as long as you want. You right. got a 30 year old and you want to fund the thing till 65, that's fine. <coughs> you know, make pre and again, the great thing about everybody's <coughs> index product is that it's universal life. Make a premium this year, <coughs> can't next year, life's different, changed, make up for it in year three. You had a question? Uh, can owners bonus themselves or partners? Oh, God, yes. It's even better, dude. We didn't have <coughs> out of time. That's, that's even easier. The, the number one question, I'm, I'm sorry, 40 no, take 10 it, seconds. Go, no, no, okay. no, take it down. The small business owner is even easier. So what did I just talk about? I talked about the W-2 employee, right? Because I've got no cost. I can walk in and look at Ryan in the eye and say, I've got a plan for you, for your key people and yourself, no cost. <coughs> and I swear, I haven't been drinking yet today. Okay, later, yes. But right now, he could do a breathalyzer and he realize I'm not, you know, just crazy. Now, what about the business owner that's, that's an S, an LLC, or an LLP? Okay, the number one question they ask advisors every single year is how can I get as much money out of this business and pay as little tax as possible and not wear orange in California or pink underwear in Arizona? Okay, Sheriff Joe. Okay? Well, what were the solutions of the past? 419, 412. You know who's making money in that business now? Lawyers. Litigators. Yes. Section 79 is probably around the corner. If you don't think so, start Googling Section 79. There are several accounting firms and large ones that are out there, just a woodpecker on the IRS's head. So, the small business owner asks that question, and who prompts the question? The CPA. The CPA says, hey, Miguel, you got money left in here. And if you don't spend it, you're going to pay tax on it. So what do you do as a business owner? I like to call it chasing your tail. You go and buy stuff. Staples. Yeah, okay, I want a case. Yeah. No, give me a pallet of post-its. Okay, great. And then, hmm, Dell, give me some computers for the office, whatever. It's just crazy. You're chasing your tail. I mean, how many post-it notes and paper clips can a guy use? But you do that to create justifiable legal gap expenses deductions. I would say, you know, do all that. Do your thing for what you need. But stop. Let's just assume for a minute you had maybe $100,000 left in your business. Could be a million, could be twenty thousand dollars. I don't care. You see, as a small business owner of an S, an LLC, or an LLP, you get to do a great accounting thing. It's called a K one distribution. It's accounting one of two class, I think that is. Okay, K one distribution. Some might call it dividend. Okay, why would they do that instead of bonusing themselves? Because there's another tax besides income tax that business owners hate more. It's employment tax, sixteen point four. That's their side of the fight of you. You love that. You pay it all day long, brother. Sorry. I'll buy you a drink tonight to make up for the money. Okay? All right. So if you take a K-1 distribution from your business, there's no employment tax. None. Okay? And then you might say to me, Nick, well, okay, yeah, all right, super genius, Wiley Coyote. So yeah, all right, so I took money out of the business, created a deduction there. I don't have any tax. It's passed through. But now, genius, i got to pay for it. Well, yeah, hold on. You do. You do. I'm going to say you put your $100,000 in my solar plant, and when your taxes are due, I don't care if it's next month, next April, or in October, if you like to you know, stretch the IRS out you know, from time to time and let them have their money in October, hey, it's their rules, it's their world, right? Why not? I don't care when it is. We're going to, and you owe forty grand on that, on that uh, $100,000 as an example, we're going to send you a check or a Fed funds wire to your bank account with forty grand. You pay the taxes. You still have $100,000 working in our index product. The taxes have been paid. We didn't break any rules, get any weird deductions. We're not looking over back all the time. All right? We've done presentations in CPA, CPE classes in Southern California with 22 different CPA firms last year. And not a one of them said, you're crazy. This is wrong. You know, get out. You're, you know, none of them. Because this is basic accounting. All we're doing is we're doing one of two things. We're either restoring taxes lost to a W-2 employee or we are providing the money to pay the tax that's going to be due on money that hasn't been taxed. Okay? This concept has a lot of different spaces. I mean, we could go on this for a long time. 
So it's unique, it's new, it's, we've had it for three years around. Um, we actually got this idea from someone else, um, another one of our bigger agents that did this with VUL, and he was writing $40 million a year with this before he retired in San Diego. Similar concept, okay? Business owners love this. They're concerned with taxes and savings, okay? You show them a way that they can still pay their taxes legally, but they can use their pre-tax money for their own benefit, they're gonna love it. And this K-1 distribution, it happens all day long. Final point on this, how many of you have ever put in a case in underwriting when you know the, guy, the guy's got a nice business and he writes down on his application, oh yeah, I make uh, 75 grand. <laughs> really? That S63 AMG says otherwise. That I just slightly dinged when I pulled in next to in my rental car. Okay? <laughs> well, of course, because what are they doing? They're taking distributions from the company. Somehow they think that by just taking a distribution, they're kind of hiding. Please. They're not hiding from anybody. Okay? Other than you, and it's going to cause you pain in underwriting on any other type of case. You're like, God, I thought you made more than this. And you're asking, you're asking for $10 million and you only make 100 grand? Oh my God, we're never going to get this through. It's K1 distribution. Business owners do it all the time. How do you think they buy their stuff? Business buys it. So that's for the small business owner. I ran through it fast. That's a whole other presentation, but it rocks. Okay? So thank you all for your time. Any questions? Other questions? Yes? You collateralize. I'm sorry? You have you materials? You have materials? We you can get easier. everything to you. We've we got you. And it goes deeper than this. You can do the same thing if you wanted to blow out of an IRA. We can show you using 72TQ. Brad and I have got a combo on that, all right, through annuity and then in life insurance. We'll pay the taxes on a distribution from any IRA custodian, too. Okay? Plus, using 72TQ, we avoid the 10% penalty. Hot dog. Okay? So, thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a, a quick break. Uh, one thing I, I will add on, on this uh, solar plan is we've seen it be really useful when you're talking to doctors, dentists, or attorneys and CPAs, anyone who has uh, a, any kind of medical malpractice liability or fiduciary responsibility li that the, there's a liability there because they are uh, often looking to hide money from uh, lawsuits as well, and they don't necessarily want to take it, but they need to get it out of their business. Uh, and this allows them to do that because, as we all know, life insurance can be a uh, safe haven for lawsuits. So, uh, I'll just add that. And it, we'll go ahead and take our break now. I think we've got uh, 10 or 15, what is it, 10 minutes? Yeah, whatever. 10, 15, we'll, we'll. I think we've all seen what be the forefront of annuity companies' minds, marketing, product development in the last probably five years. What is it? Guaranteed, guaranteed income writers. Guaranteed income. Right? People are going to have to start decumulating assets. Um, we went through and built a great uh, income rider to attach to our standard product lineup. It's called the Income Protector. Uh, very unique feature that's the only one that gives you all the fees back if you don't run out of your real money um, in the entire marketplace, even if you took income. And so that's one unique feature that we have on that particular product. But what we also did is created a new product that, that's really, I think, the fastest growing annuity vehicle in the marketplace today, which is a deferred income annuity. We've seen those. New York Life has got one. I think AG's got one. I think there's a couple other smaller carriers that, are, that have one. But what are the issues with deferred income annuities? They're the same issues that are there with single premium immediate annuities, right? What are the restrictions that you have on both of those types of products? Once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, you're in, right? You better make, make sure that you know exactly when you're going to go through and take income, right? And guess what? If things change, what do we, the big bad insurance company, say? Oh, well. That's our contract, right? You went through and bought an immediate annuity from us that we get, we're going to guarantee you a thousand bucks a month for the rest of your life, no questions asked, right? You need more income, what do we say? Too bad, right? You need less income, you win the lottery, what do we say? Too bad, we're sending you a thousand bucks a month. And that's why there's been a very small portion of people that have gone through and actually annuitized contracts or purchased single premium immediate annuity contracts. Well now this deferred income annuity comes out which says immediate annuity is required by law, you have to t take receipt of your first check within what? One year, 12 months. Well, companies started developing a deferred income annuity which says 
we're gonna go through and do a similar type income payout option, but you can defer it out more than 12 months, right? You tell us when you wanna take that income, and we'll set that and we'll give you a dollar payout guaranteed for the rest of your life. So you're 55 today, you give us $100,000, we're gonna say when you are 65, you're gonna get $9,500 a year for the rest of your life, guaranteed. Just like an immediate annuity. You get exclusion ratio, you get all that other kind of good stuff too, right? Well, the issue with that is there's no flexibility. How many times do your clients know what is exactly gonna happen 10 years from now? Does that happen? Zero, right? Things change. Maybe they want to retire earlier. Maybe they can't afford to retire and they need to push it out later, right? And those type of contracts lock you in to that sort of distribution. So what we did is we developed the ING Lifetime Income Annuity, which is similar to that of a deferred income annuity, but you don't have to pick up front when you're gonna take it. We illustrate this product out similar to that of like a social security letter that your clients get to show what? At 65, here's your number, right? Full retirement age, 66, here's your number. 70, here's your number, right? That's how we go through and illustrate this. So we show them from turning it on 30 days to 15, 20, 25 years, and however long they wanna go through and show it, exactly what their income check would be, and we're still able to go through and provide guaranteed income that's right up there, if not better, than the New York Life product that's the biggest selling and did two billion dollars last year in sales. So we're able to give that flexibility in there. What else did we bring the ability to do? Start and stop draws. We've been able to do that. We've been able to give a walk away. You want to walk away in nine years, so there's just nine year surrender charge period. You could walk away in nine years. So we built the flexibility for guaranteed to provide this rivaling contracts with a lot less flexibility in it, and we built some neat features in it. And the first one I want to show you is something real quick. And when, when you talk about income planning with your clients, is it about income number or is it about cash flow? What are you talking about? Cash flow. Cash flow? Because that's what really matters, right? Cash flow. So I, I went through and I, I do a lot of these presentations. We've had this product out for about a month and a half. We finally got it in California here about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, but when I sit in a room like this, people say, what's most important is the best number I can get from a WB rider in the marketplace. That's what they say. I said, okay, let's go through and look at that real quick. And let's talk about non-qualified money only because this is really where we're the most competitive inside of this new ING Lifetime Income product. And what I do is I say, okay, what is the income rider or product Index annuity, VA, whatever it may be, what are you using today? You know, and we'll just call it company X, right? And we're gonna look at the accumulation value today, the income in 10 years, right? And your accumulation value in 10 years, all right? So let's use apples to apples, $100,000 CD replacement, right? What's the national average for a CD rate right now for a one year CD? Quarter percent. What was that? Quarter percent. Quarter percent. Right in there. So we're going to take and we're going to say you're making 260 bucks on this taxable, right? We're going to show you how you can leverage this for guaranteed income for life that you're not going to be able to match any place else. So we've got $100,000 we're going to put in today, right? What is going to be the account value in most deferred annuity products? that are gonna be used to generate income with the fees, rider charges, and such, that may be attached. What are they looking at for an accumulation value after 10 years? Has anyone looked at that at all? How much growth will be in the contract? 145. 145? Let's go through and use 145, right? So your accumulation value in 10 years at company X is gonna be 145, okay? And let's say, just for hypothetical purposes, their income generation at age 65 is gonna go through and be $10,000 a year for the rest of their life, okay? Now let's look at the ING Lifetime Income Annuity product. All right, ING Lifetime Income Annuity. Account value today is 100 grand. Account value in 10 years is 100 grand, okay? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I know what happens. Depends on what happens, 
right? What can we see from that 100 grand being exactly the same 10 years from now? What's the first inherent thing? You have no chance to lose your money and you're, and you're not paying any fees, right? Because if the market was down every single year, right, and we had to pay fees on this, even though it's a fixed product, we're paying 65 basis points a year in fees, that's $6,500, right? So first off, we have no fees in this product, right? Or in these other products, you're paying a fee for the guaranteed income. No fees. Income. Let's go through and look at this just for hypothetical reasons. And let's say in this example, our income is $9,500. Which has more income for your client? The company extras, right? Because they have 10000 So let's look at that example here where they count by as from the 145. How much of that $10,000 is taxed? In company X. Is all 10000 taxable? Last and first out rules, right? With regards to annuity distributions. So you have 10,000 in taxes and let's use 30%. So what's your cash flow on this side? $7,000, right? After they pay taxes. Guess what your cash flow on our side is? 9,500. Why is that? Return of principal. We have not gained any interest credits on the account value side, and so when we start distributing out, we're giving back principal first. So when you look at all the studies out there with regards to retirees' spending habits, when do they spend the most amount of money? Right after retirement. Right after. That's their go-go <coughs> right? Because that's when they're able to be active out here playing golf, going on trips, doing all that other kind of good stuff. Twenty-five hundred dollars additional cash flow for them and we know that they're going to get that for what 10 plus years right we've gone through and we're giving back and guess what they run out of their premium it's all taxable at that point in time right but what is if we change these numbers to five hundred thousand and took everything times five if they're able to get fifty thousand or forty nine five in cash flow for those first 10 years and this person's 65 now do they need to turn on social security immediately? Or do you think that pure cash flow of $50,000 is what they needed to cover their nut? Is enough to go through and make up for Social Security and push that out maybe to max, max retirement age? Either 66, 70? I mean, could you look at it right here, you know, 30% difference or 25% difference about, right? It's about what a Social Security check would be, right? $2,500. So we can go through and push out so once they do hit, and we have to pay taxes on our distributions, we're funneling more money into the pot for their cash flow, right? At that point in time, you, the advisor, can go through and show your clients with 100% certainty of when they're gonna hit their taxes, right? So if you're doing other lines of business out there, do you think that would be good? You know, different qualified assets saying we're gonna push that out and we can go through and tailor it in to when we're gonna hit different taxes? Be, become more of a cash flow planner rather than just an income generation number planner? Absolutely key. And look at it like from a life insurance funding perspective. Which would you rather fund a life insurance policy with? 9500 9500 wouldn't you? And you know 10 years, you got $9,500 tax-free going into that life policy, right? You get 10 years from now, you have to start paying tax on this, maybe the policy's performed well enough that now you start pulling out loans to supplement that income at that point in time, right? So you don't have an exclusion ratio like you would with immediate annuity, but you've got pure cash flow planning. And remember, this is just on non-qualified money. The same product, what we do is in five years, we boost the benefit base for income to 150%, right? A lot of companies that we have roll-ups and things like that, we have a 6% compounding roll-up on our standard withdrawal rider, but we say in five years, your benefit base is guaranteed to be 150 Right, based off 100,000. In 10 years, we guarantee it to be 225,000, right? Which is 845 compounded over that period of time. If you have somebody that does not qualify for life insurance, you have the ability to add an optional death benefit right into this product, okay? Which allows you to take the benefit base out over five years. No underwriting whatsoever. So if somebody has a lump sum of money, Sitting in a CD today, that what are you going to do with this? Well, I'm just going to leave it to my kids. 
where else are you gonna find 845 compounded interest guaranteed for 10 years towards a death benefit with no underwriting? They live 10 years in a day, their beneficiary gets 225,000 in death benefit proceeds. Question? So I might have missed this. So your um, 50% uh, after five years increase in the benefit base, is that out the gate or uh, after the distribution starts? That, that's a, with no distributions. So we, we basically go through and we say, if you wait for five years to live or die, your benefit base is guaranteed to be at 150,000, right? Or 50% increase in your deposit. If you wait 10 years to turn on income or die, you get 225. So you're basically guaranteeing the benefit base like at 8.4% after? Yep. yep, 845 after 10 years. Yep, and then that's where the death benefit would stop. So if you have, you know, the trade off for that is not in the fee. It's just less guaranteed income. But if we're dying, you know, buying this for death benefit coverage, who cares about what the guaranteed income flow is, right? The only caveat is, is it blows up at age 90. So, but if they're not qualified for life insurance, they're probably not going to live at age 90, right? Yes, sir. Death taxes is like an annuity. Interest is, is ordinary income, and cost basis, of course, would be 100%. 100% tax. Yep, just the amount of interest. So if they put in $100,000 out of a CD initially, that's tax free. Right. But all the rest of the interest is taxable. Exactly. So they put in $100,000 and it grows to $150,000, but the death benefit, right, it makes it $200,000. Mm -hmm. That second $50,000 is tax ordinary. ordinary income. Yep. But it's split up over five years, so they're going to get hit with 10, 10, 10. Yep. So next next sales idea, real quick. Um, CD replacement, right? It's another big thing and one of the biggest things that we've been able to go through and capture a lot of money off the sidelines is you look at that CD rate being 26 basis points or 0.25 today, right? For a one year CD. We can go through and in our fixed account, all of our deferred index annuity products, we guarantee the fixed account to be 1% can never be less contractual. So what can we do to cover 25 basis points? How much of $100,000 will we have to go through and put into our fixed account, 1% to equal the same $250 that the bank's gonna give them? 25 grand, right? So we go through, we put 25 grand now in our fixed account. We're gonna <coughs> equal $250 in interest, right? Same thing that they're going to get at their financial institution right now. But what do we get? We get tax deferral. We get all that other kind of good stuff, right? How do you go through and make it better for your client? What is the number one sold CD in America right now? In the masses? Does anyone know? Brand or like duration? Brand. Who sees Ally Bank? What is Ally Bank's big claim to fame? You may see, but actually but they hid CD from do. What's their, What do they say that their CD will do? Oh, it will increase. If rates go up, they have the ability to increase the rate one time, right? So is there a formula or anything guaranteed with that? No. It's up to their sole discretion, just like us, the annuity carriers, to say, hey, we're going to offer you a one-year rate at 4% and a base rate at 1.5%. And, and guess what? That base rate could go up and it could go down to 1 or whatever the minimum is. Do we ever move it up? Typically not. I mean, you look at you know another company that's not here in the room right now, and I've looked at their renewal rates for the last six years, and they've never moved it up once. Whatever they, they said is the base rate, that's where it's renewed at. So here, let's take that ally, raise your rate CD marketing, and say, here's how we can do it contraction. We created a, a indexing strategy that we're the only ones in the marketplace to have, which is called the interest rate benchmark strategy. What it does is tracks interest rates. As interest rates move up, we take the change in interest rates, multiply it by a multiplier, and credit that to the contract on an annual point-to-point -point basis. So today, our benchmark that we're using is the three-month LIBOR rate, okay? Three-month LIBOR rate today is 0.27. As of this morning, 0.27. All-time low is 0.245. When is the appropriate time to go into anything market length? Is it when it said it's all time low or all time high? Low. Low, right? So we're almost at the all time low today. 
we're already going to guarantee to give you the same amount of interest as the bank's going to give you, right? Your $250 with $25,000 of your 100 grand. But we're at 0.27 a day. Rates go up. Let's say this LIBOR rate goes up to 0.77 one year from now. How much of an increase is that? 50, 50 points, basis. Right? We have a multiplier in our seven year plan, which is what most advisors are using. We have a multiplier of five and a half times. What's five and a half times 50 basis points? 2.75. So on the other 75,000, they're making 2.75%. Guaranteed contraction, no questions asked. Because what's gonna happen if you let this client sit there in a CD for another year, at 0.25 and CD rates go up 2.75 now. Are they all of a sudden going to have the aha moment that I'm ready to move out and rock and roll in a fixed product outside of the bank? No, they're going to say, I want to wait to see if you hire again, right? Or if I can show you how to make, you know, what is that, about $1,800 in additional interest in 12 months, not in 24 months? Do you think that would be a motivating factor for them? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So a lot of advisors are having a lot of success using, utilizing this strategy. And guess what? What is the main problem with index annuity cap rates right now? What are they? Everyone says they're so low, right? This has a cap at 10%. So rates spike up 2%, with a five and a half times multiplier, they're making double digit returns, right? And this is just one of the options. And guess what? If your client goes through and sees 275 on 75% of the money, do you think they're going to say, next year when the CD rates are going to offer them 75, hey, can you put 75,000 now so I can meet, meet the same as the bank? No, they're not going to say that. They're going to probably say, hey, let's put 100% in this, or 100% in one of the other upside strategies that are out there. So very simple approach to go through and utilize interest rates only in the discussion about an index annuity sale. Because you look at a lot of people and they're out of the market because of what? They're scared of it, right? They don't want to be in the market. So if we go and talk about S&P 500 or Dow or NASDAQ only strategies with these people that are sitting in interest rate driven bank vehicles today, do you think they're going to be turned on by saying, I don't like the market, I think it's going to go down, and now you're going to give me a 2 or 3% cap rate on the upside to go through data transition today? No, they're not going to be motivated by that. But if you can talk about interest rates only, Right, guaranteeing the same amount of earnings as they would have gotten at the bank with their raise your rate strategy that's interest rate driven, contractually, is that a motivating factor? Definitely. So I had this story with, a, with an advisor up in uh, Utah uh, last year. I presented the strategy in October at a lunch and learn meeting like this. Come back in, in December, I said, hey, what happened? $887,000 an additional premium. What 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 would that come by? And it wasn't over one or two cases. It was over about 15 cases. He goes, I took this idea out to every single one of my clients and just asked them what they're getting at the bank and said, I have a way to go through and raise your rate and give you some other benefits along with you. So absolutely key. Any questions on this whatsoever? Okay. That's a secure index seven product. But it can be done on our five-year product or 10-year product or seven-year product, but most advisors are using our seven-year as a shorter term and duration and it's the biggest bang for your buck from an increase in interest rates with the, with the highest amount of money. So um, last one that I'll go through and use real quick and then we'll go through and uh, get it turned on over to Justin is um, how many people know people with bonds? Right? A lot of bonds. Why do they go into bonds? Thought they'd be safe, right? Income, right? What is the inherent risk of people that have gone into bonds in the last five years? Rising interest rates. Rising rates, right? Bankruptcy. What was that? In bankruptcy. Stop bankruptcy, it. right? The defaults. So we're sitting there today, and people are getting concerned. Finner put out a warning about a month ago, saying to all advisors, "You better go through and be cognizant of what, you know, how much you have your clients exposed to bonds." and what the duration of those bonds are, right? When you look at bond, bond funds, which are sold primarily where? Inside of financial institutions, right? 
banks sell a lot of bond funds. Why do they do that? Their FAs don't or can't sell bonds. So they push them all into bond funds. Well, bond funds are doing what? Adding duration to their portfolio. Because of why? Yield. Yield, yield right? To get yield. So I go through and I went to my bank. I got a you know, 401k rollover. I go to my bank and I say, I'm scared of the market. What are, what are my options? You need a bond fund, Brad. Great. Well, I have an average duration bond fund right now, 10 years, and that may be able to spit you off 2.5%. Okay? So I think that's a great deal. I'm getting my two, you know, $2,500. But guess what? All of a sudden, rates start coming. Do you know what the average effect for a 10-year duration bond fund is on principal value when rates go up 1%? 9. 7. What was that? 7. 7 to 10%, depending on, depending on how they've got it split up. If they're in treasuries, it's around set, a little over 7. So you go through and have that happen, and you, you see that value start going down. You die, they have to sell off that asset, what happens? Kids are pissed, why did I, you go through and have my parents in such a high quality, quality or high duration of bonds, my you know, inheritance has just gone down 30 percent because rates have started climbing back up to normal levels of two, three, four percent. So what did we just talk about in the previous sales strategy that could possibly be a hedge for that rising rate environment? We use the interest rate benchmark strategy, right? So we have the interest rate benchmark strategy where if you have a 7% decrease in principal value, how can you sure up that bond portfolio? Because they may not be able to get out of it because they paid high fees to go through and get inside of it, right? And they don't know when it's gonna go up. But if you went through and took that $100,000 bond, right? Bond fund strategy that goes down 7%, so and you know it goes down to ninety three thousand. How much money at a five and a half times multiplier would it take to go through and cover that? About one hundred and twenty, one hundred twenty five thousand, right? So five and a half thousand. So we put one hundred and twenty five thousand in secure seven, seven in the interest rate benchmark strategy. Five and a half times multiplier, right? So rates go up we cover that $7,000, right? So we can now go through and make this, you know, what, uh, 133, or no, 132,000, right? We shirt up that portfolio without giving up principal protection, right? But we've gone through and covered their bond risk because what are most, you know, brokers gonna say to do to cover inflation protection and rising interest rates? What? Buy gold, maybe one of them. The other ones are aggressive equities, right? Aggressive equities will help hedge inflation. Here's a way to hedge that risk in a principally protected vehicle that goes up when bonds go up, when interest rates start falling. Simple way to go through and offset it. Um, this idea, you know, people come across bonds, they know about the risk that's out there, they can't afford to get away from it because they may have paid a big fee for it. But guess what? If they have a bunch of money in bonds or bond funds, I bet they have a bunch of money in cash too. So if you can show them a way of saying when rates go up, here's the effect. And there's a great article in Bloomberg that talks about effects on principal values of bonds and bond funds. When rates start going up, let's go through and protect that on the other side. Principally protected, can't go through and lose it every year we lock it in. So if we go through and lock it in a couple years and rates go back down again, guess what? We're locked in. We're ahead of the game even there. So it's a great new strategy to go through and protect your client's assets with their goals if they have exposure to bonds. So any questions on any of these three strategies right now? Crediting options, product sets, things of that nature. What happens in year two with that client? Okay, let's say it, what the question was what happens in year two? So in year one, we went through and captured that upside. We locked into it at 132,000. Let's say rates went down the next year. This 132,000 is principally protected. It's not gonna go back down. Your rate could be zero. It's just like any other indexing strategy that if the benchmark or the indice goes down, what happens? You get a zero, right? Zero is your hero is a cliche that's been put out there in the marketplace. So you get a zero back here. 
But if you wanted to, you said, okay, well, I think rates are going to go back down. We have our fixed account. We can go get 1% at least in our fixed account in the next 12 months if you wanted to do that. Rates go up and Yep. Whatever rates do go up, you get five and a half times that up to a 10% cap. Up to a 10% cap rate. Any other questions? Matt knows all the stuff um, that we went through today. Definitely leverage him as a resource. Um, we've got some new marketing pieces that are coming out on that CD design that I just showed him this morning that I think we finally got the final copy for the clients. Um, so definitely look at that. And then, uh, you know, the last thing is, is we are gonna make it very easy to do business with us on the ING duty side. Uh, we know term insurance, right? There's been a lot of online submission, right? We do term insurance. We're going to be able to do that on annuities through our own proprietary platform in July. To make it easy. It won't, it won't allow you to miss anything. It takes away all the not in good order issues that the other company doesn't require. Wet signatures for transfer paperwork, we can fax it directly over to them the same day. So it'll increase our processing times and, and you're getting paid substantially by taking out all those variables that could happen in the meantime. So, uh, with that being said, I'll be around through lunch. I appreciate your time. Hopefully you've got a couple ideas that you can take out into your practice later on this afternoon or, or the next week. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. We've got uh, Justin Shippen from Genworth coming right up here in just a second uh, as he passes out a couple flyers, looks like. I'm just going to throw in one more thing. Uh, Matt in the back, if you'll raise your hand, and you'll probably see Matt in a minute. He's actually our uh, in-house annuity uh, broker director. He only handles annuities in our office. And he knows them. He probably has forgotten more about annuities than most of us will ever know. Um, and one of the things that we do, again, we, we leverage a lot of technology in our office. Um, we put together our own internal calculator to compare, I don't know, we got about a dozen and a half, 18, 20 carriers, all of their income riders on one uh, spreadsheet. So we can very quickly Take in a hypothetical amount of cash, look at the current age of a client, look at a future age for uh, expected retirement, and, and tell you right off the bat uh, what's the best rider. They do drastically vary between carrier and carrier. Uh, bonuses, things like that, it's all accounted for in that uh, rider. That's something that Matt can tell you about more. And with that, I will give you Justin Shipman. Do you need to help, my friend? That's okay. All right, so how are we doing? I know I'm like the last carrier presenter. Are we doing okay? Okay, so by a show of hands, how many people here would sell long-term care? Wow, that's great. How about life insurance? Okay, doing the wave here, right? And annuities? Got a couple less hands on annuities, right? So um, would it make sense if I go over kind of an index annuity presentation for clients? Sure. Does that make sense? Okay. We like whiteboards, right? So really, when you talk about index annuities, I'm sure you've heard of a lot of people saying that, I'm gonna grow your money by 8%, right? And everybody's like, well, wait a minute here. How are you growing the money by 8%? Well, you aren't technically growing the cash value by 8%, and I wanna explain that to you and how that actually works. So when you take a look at index annuities today, about 60% of sales are actually focused on income. Pretty big number. The other 40% are focused on growth, which, you know, okay, 60%, why is that? Well, that's because you got that 8% number over here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Mr. and Mrs. Klein, I wanna make sure that you understand how this index annuity works, so let me kind of explain how, how you get crediting on that. It's all gonna be based on how the S&P 500 index performs. While we're not gonna put money into the index, it's gonna be based on how the, the S&P performs. So if it goes up, well, you got a couple of different options where you can actually earn up to 12% each year. Not bad, right? If it's flat, most companies pay you 0%. We can actually pay you like 3.5%. That's our performance trigger. And of course, when the index is down, that's when zero is the hero, like Brad talked about, and you're, you're not gonna lose any money. 
Because as I mentioned before, we are putting this into the S&P 500. It's an insurance product. So this value is your cash value that you'll see on your statement each and every year. Now, there are a couple of different things that we do at January that's a little bit different. We're gonna give you a guarantee, we call it a guaranteed minimum accumulation value of 107% at the end of the seven year surrender charge schedule. What's that equate to? A CD-like return, right? So when you're looking at safe money alternatives, we're gonna give you this upside potential here, but we're gonna guarantee that at the end of seven years, you're gonna make more than what your CD's paying. By the way, a five-year CD right now is about 64 basis points. So, guaranteed. Plus, we heard a lot about bailouts with the government a couple of years ago. This is usually when I get a laugh, right? No bailout laughs? <laughs> so, uh, what this does is it protects your client against us decreasing this potential earnings. So, if we, if we breach the bailout and you have the rate flyers in front of you, your client has a 45-day window to take all their money out, no surrender charges, no loss of premium bonuses on the 10-year product, no market value adjustments. So great opportunity to protect your client again. So really what this is doing is we're offering upside potential with downside protection. Sound pretty good, right? I have a strong guarantee, I have 12% opportunities for crediting, and your client's not gonna lose any money in a negative year. But you may not be focused on growth, Mr. or Ms. Client. You may be more concerned about income. And I know right now the number one concern people have is outliving their savings. And that's why 60% of these sales are focused on income. So I already told you that 8%, we're gonna grow your money by 8% for the first 10 years, guaranteed. What we do that's a little bit different is we actually grow it on a daily basis. So how that helps is that I've seen a lot of people end up retiring earlier than they expected to. They might have health concerns, their spouses might have health concerns, there might be you know, downsizing at their company, things happen, right? What daily basis growth does is that if I'm three quarters of the way through my contract here, I'm actually crediting 6%, right? Three quarters of the 8%. Good deal for the client because most contracts go like this. They step up on contract anniversaries. We actually grow like this on a daily basis. It's a big differentiator on the contract and after all, anybody here work with variable annuities? Create income? Do clients start income on contract anniversaries? Or some other day? Some other day. Some other day, right? This, any day <coughs> that they retire or start income, they're gonna get maximum benefits. If they're 11 months and 29 days into a contract here and it happens to be their birthday and they start income, they're gonna lose 11 months and 29 days with our competition. They get all the crediting with us up to that point. So almost the full 8%. If they don't wanna start taking income in the first 10 years, we're actually gonna take this cash value, the money that this is growing at, and add it in to the benefit base over here. And I should write up here, benefit base. Because this is a number that we use to calculate lifetime income. And when you're looking at retirement plans today, what are clients trying to do? Get the most income, right? They're trying to maximize the growth on their 401k within their mutual funds, their stock portfolio, everything to maximize income. I can guarantee I'm growing the number to calculate income by 8% for the first 10 years. And when I take a look at a 65-year-old, I get a 5% income stream. By the way, everyone knows the 4% rule is dead, right? 1994, they came out with the 4% rule, said that if you take 4% from your portfolio, there's only a 10% chance that you're gonna run out of money. And the new statistics are 2.8%. I'm giving you a 5% withdrawal rate for an individual. I'm giving you a 4.5% 
withdrawal rate for a joint payout. Domestic partners also, right? So I'm beating that 2.8%, I'm beating that 4%, and I'm guaranteeing the growth for the client. Now I know this sounds too good to be true, and there is a cost to it. The cost of the rider is less than 1%, and it's only available for clients age 55 to 80. I can't give it to everyone. Because it's insurance, it's a mortality play, right? But pretty good opportunity for your clients today. Do they want growth? safe and secure where they don't lose their money? Or do they want an income stream that they're gonna have that they can never outlive? What do you think they're gonna say? Income. Most of the time income, right? 8% sounds pretty darn good. So that's kind of just on a, the T-bar presentation, a quick way to show your clients and tell them that, look, I know you probably heard some things about index annuities and I just wanna make sure you understand the product, you know? And let me quickly go through this. And then you ask them, which one's right for you? And by the way, I'm only looking at like 20% of the portfolio. So if we have any stockbrokers in here, don't worry, I'm only looking at about 20% of the portfolio. I want to take this income stream to cover essential living expenses. Things like food, gas, lights turned on, roof overhead, insurance paid for, right? Because after all, what, what good as a life insurance policy if it lapses. Not very good. I'm using this to cover essential living expenses. And one of the things that I can do with this is I can use my fixed index annuity to, to pay this income, right? And some people might actually have a long-term care policy that they're paying for. Now, normally when you pay for a long-term care policy, when you take money out of an annuity, you have to like step up the amount to net my $4,000 premium, right? I might have to take $5,000 out, then we get taxes, and I net the $4,000 premium. Make sense? That's what you're doing right now, right? So if you're selling long-term care, you're usually taking an after-tax distribution from some place to pay the net premium on long-term care. For non-qualified funds, I can make this where it's $4,000 from our annuities to pay the $4,000 long-term care premium. It's the Pension Protection Act. And I know not everyone follows this as far as in insurance, and I'll tell you why. Their systems are limited. What we're doing is we're taking a partial 1035 from the annuity going directly to the long-term care policy. You know companies don't like doing partial 1035s, right? It's hard to track basis. What we're doing is we set up our system because after all, Genworth's the number one provider of long-term care. It's the company that you want paying your long-term care claims because we have the most experience out of every other company. In fact, if you add up the next 10 carriers after us that sell long-term care, our premium still beats the next 10. It's a lot, that's a big difference, right? And that's one of the reasons why we do the Pension Protection Act. So literally, transfer that old life insurance policy, that BUL that's collapsing, will retain the tax basis on it, right? Or, if they want, fund their long-term care federal income tax free. And I know uh, Matt and uh, Ryan and Nikhil can help you with this if you need illustrations. I like selling two sales, right? Get the annuity, get the long-term care. And by the way, the $1,000 that we saved here, what can you do with that? <laughs> Rick's going, sell more life insurance, right? Sell more something. Get them more benefits. And if you have clients that have long-term care insurance right now, and they were concerned about the premium increases we just had to do, ask them how they're paying for their long-term care. Reposition assets, help them save tax dollars to make up that premium increase. Those premium increases are alive and well in long-term care. This is one solution to overcome that. <clears throat> Make sense? Okay, so where are we at total? 20 sales ideas so far? We've got 21, actually. I've been out of the market for a few 
little bit of time. Uh -huh. I haven't heard the California Partnership mentioned at all. That's because we just pulled out of the California Partnership. Yeah. Uh, we expect to have a new long-term care product hopefully approved this summer, um, but Sacramento is not cooperating. We actually filed the product two years ago, and it still has not been approved. Is anybody here anymore? Uh, not many people in the partnership. I don't That's think anyone in the partnership right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Hancock, I think, is the only one. Right? They're back, right? Yeah. yeah. They were up. So, but, uh, I mean, crazy. When you start taking a look at the opportunities and the need for long-term care, there's a reason why the counterparts here are talking about life insurance with long-term care. But not everybody has that single premium lump sum. And when I take a look at $4,000 to pay for the life of that long-term care policy, I'm talking about a $50,000 premium, not a hundred or $200,000 premium, right? So when I started in the industry with Mutual of Omaha 20 years ago, I'd go out and meet with clients and clients who have money in their house and money in their 401k or their, their pension plan, right? And I hated it because what could you do 20 years ago with that money? Not much. Well, now we actually have in-service distributions allowed on 401k plans. And this is a great opportunity for you to go talk to your clients and, and find out if they're over age 59 and a half, if they're comfortable with the asset choices that they have within their 401k. And oftentimes, when you're 59 and a half, are you being aggressive on your investments or more conservative? Conservative. More conservative, right? Do 401k plans offer annuities? Not normally. Very limited. Very limited. What are they offering today as that conservative choice? Bonds. Bonds, income type funds, sub accounts, right? And Brad just talked about the interest rate risk. So, wait a minute, I'm putting my money into this bond, sub account, mutual fund, and interest rates may go up, that doesn't sound like a good deal to me. So I can go in, I can check with my company and literally go to any employer's website, <laughs> put Stanford 401k, literally I've done this. Stanford 401k, it brings up a nice page talking about the retirement plans, you scroll down a little bit and it talks about age-based in-service withdrawals and it actually has the form there that if the employee at Stanford wants to do this, the form is actually on the website already. I did this with United Airlines, the flight attendants. Just go to their website, put in their company name, put in 401k, and you can find out if they can do this. It's easy. Everybody says, well, how do you know? Well, let's just check out the website. You know, the internet's a great thing for us. Makes life a lot easier. Uh, this is a way to take money out of the 401k, and after all, they're looking at that, that income for life, so now I'm looking at growing that money, right, by 8% to create that lifetime income. How much is their bond fund going to raise each year? Who knows? Who knows? So if I can guarantee the client that I'm going to increase their nest egg by 8% each year to create that lifetime income, that's a pretty good story. You think you might be able to sell that? Marty said he could, right? Everybody else, no pressure, right? So, but huge opportunity for you today. And of course, I have to beat up on variable annuities because we're on the roll with 401ks, right? That people sell variable annuities today? Okay. We actually, variable annuities, they do a great job. And, and they've had the story for income for a long time. And, you know, it used to be that, that you could get the 6% compound and you could be really aggressive with the investments, and it wouldn't cost you very much for the riders. The challenge is, though, is that the costs have gone up. So now I'm looking at a 4% cost, kind of on average, when I look at fund charges, the M&E, the rider fees. And my opportunity, my growth opportunity, now I have allocation restrictions where I have to put a third into income type assets and maybe two thirds, whoops, in uh, other assets, right? So we're limiting the upside on the variable annuity and we're actually increased the fees. 
So my 8% on my index annuity, what do I need to do on the variable annuity to equal that 8%? 4% P, right? So I have to get a 12% return or better each and every year over the next 10 years to grow that money just the same as my index annuity. Anybody here gonna say 12%? <laughs> I wish we could, right? I wish we could. Um, but when you look at the illustrations, they're still showing historical performance, which I love it. It's not a future indicator, right? You know, it's past performance is no indication of future performance. But I can move money from the VA to the index annuity to, to and basically reduce this cost because it's only 80 basis points, which, by the way, I've found out that uh, clients don't understand basis points, right? So just tell them it's less than 1%. It's going to cost you less than 1% each year for the rider fee. So it makes it a lot easier. Then you don't have to explain the basis points. But if they have money in a VA or, or other assets, you have to take a look at what their benefit base is because you might not want to move it because you might lose that when you move it. But if they didn't have that income story, maybe a good opportunity to reduce the cost overall for the client and give them better benefits today. Make sense? So where am I at on my time? You're right up on it. Okay, so one one last thing, and I will close it up, because we hooked this up, so i got to use it at least once, right? <laughs> we have a new strategy called CapMax. And I'm going to tell you, for those new to index annuities, CapMax is not the easiest story. But if I could show you a way to multiply your earnings next year, Mr. and Ms. Clint, would you be interested? Because I know right now, agents are thinking 4% cap rates are too low. So we have a 4% cap on our seven year product for $100,000. And that's a good cap today, it's the annual cap. What I can do with CapMax though, is year one, S&P is up, good news, right? I take my 4%, I can either credit it to my cash value and have $104,000, or I can take it for year two and create a three times multiplier on the following year's return. I like that idea, I'm gonna move that in and create this multiplier here instead. Now, what I've ended up doing is reducing my cash value to the 104,000, because I elected not to apply the 4% credit. I'm exchanging it for the multiplier. So year two, S&P goes up again. Now I got that 4% times three. Well, that's a 12% return for the client. The good news for the client is that the S&P doesn't have to go up 12% to get 12%. It only has to go up 4% to get that 12%. So, same thing. Do I want to subtract out the 4% and end up with $108,000 here? Or do I want $112,000? Your client gets to choose what they want. But a lot of people like this multiplier. They do it again, goes up three years in a row because the S&P tends to be streaky. I got that 12% choice again, and the default is that I'm always gonna continue to roll forward to create that multiplier. And when we take a look at that, and just how it compares to other strategies, well, the 50 basis point conservative on, the, on your far left, what do you think that's comparing to? CDs, CDs right? Well, yeah, we offer a 644% better return on average than that CD. As we move up, 4.5% annual point to point cap, even better than what we're offering. I don't know anybody who's offering 4.5, but we're still performing better on average with cap max than even that 4.5% cap. So we've created a way to offer more potential earnings for your clients. And remember my income story in year 11? We add dollar for dollar growth to the benefit base if the client hasn't started taking income. This is just a great opportunity for your clients that haven't started taking income, that want that benefit base to keep growing. 
without resetting surrender charges, without increasing fees, without changing the policy at all, which my competitors do. So I know we're going to be around for lunch. If you have any questions, thanks for your time. Just stop by and get Rick and I. I think we can both answer annuity and life questions. So thanks again. Justin, thank you. You wanted to want to share one of our last cells it is for the afternoon or for the morning it is. So you all know, come do that. And then one thing I and hopefully I don't still mask because that would be funny. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things with the market's been the way it is, especially with life insurance and, and VULs we were mentioned a few times. Uh, there's uh, an opportunity with annuities and VUL ten thirty five exchanges to take that uh, loss of uh, basis or, or loss of value and move it over in the form of basis and get uh, additional income in the annuity product, especially when you're looking at cost basis on like an immediate annuity or deferred income annuity. It's a great way to maximize the value of the annuity income stream by taking an asset that maybe is devalued in the form of a VUL with, with the lost value uh, versus uh, premium dollars that have gone in. So it's a good one as well. Matt. Thank you very much. Well, again, we're going to uh, finish up here. Um, thank you for watching a little bit. So what have we had so far today? Life insurance, long-term care, annuities, both fixed, index, via crediting strategies, multipliers, lots of stuff to kind of digest. Well, as Ryan said, I'm on the annuity side of penny insurance, and of course I'm going to promote annuities, but why are we talking about annuities? We have people talking about income, guaranteed streams, 4%, 5%, triplers, multipliers, lots of stuff to digest. But I'm going to kind of go back down to the basics of it. I'm going to steal a note also from Brad's presentation so it doesn't get mad. Or, I mean, from Eric's. What is this? Half of my 401k? Exactly. 2008, kind of a sadistic joke, but a lot of people said, why don't I have a 401k anymore? I have a 201k. Have as much as what it used to be. People are retiring now more than ever before. And 1 1 2010. What's significant about that date as far as retirement goes? January 1st, 2010. Baby boomers at retirement age. That's what you were all the answers right? just a couple of them. Turn over here too. First day that the first baby boomer turned 65. Why is that significant? Well, we all hear the, the number, just put in any kind of number before the word trillion and you'll be correct as to how much assets are sitting on the sideline. It doesn't matter what digits you use, it's gonna be correct. There's a lot of money out there. 10,000 baby boomers a day are turning age 65, 10,000, that's a lot. For a while it was the biggest population segment in America. I think I heard that Generation Y or X slash Y is kind of overtaking them, but it's still a significant amount and it's still probably the most significant amount with a lot of assets. The Gen X and Y, they're getting out of college or going back to college again and again and again, they're living at home, they don't have assets to worry about. So what's going on in the retirement now? Well, again, 2008 hit, financial crisis, a lot of people's positions were changed. If you look over to your left, if you can see through the windows, you have people out there golfing. Well, that's great that they can do that, but the problem is that not everyone can do that. And there's a big shift in what's going on in the retirement picture. 1985, there was 89% of Fortune 100 companies offered a defined benefit plan. And if you, have, if you yourself might have had one or your parents had one, defined benefit plan, Simplest explanation is, you work for a company for X number of years, and they say, okay, because you worked for us for this long, we're gonna give you this amount of payment when you retire. That's great. A lot of people got used to that. They said, when they retire, I'll have pension for my company, take some social security, I'll retire, I'll be set. Fast forward 20 years from that 1985 to 2005, that same 89% of Fortune 100 companies offering a pension plan. Anyone know what that number's down to right now? 17%, exactly. I don't even have any notes. It's pretty I've good. seen it. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, 17% of companies are offering pension plans. Why the dramatic decrease in pension plans? Because it became too expensive. People are living longer. Companies didn't price their pensions for the life expectancy that we're experiencing now. And they couldn't afford them, so they became bankrupt. They had to freeze their pension plans. Life expectancy in the, in the United States at, at 1900, about, you know, just over 100 years ago, average life expectancy of an adult male, 48 years old. 2010, 
Now it's about 78. Significant increase in life expectancy. And again, in retirement, I'll give you a personal example as far as it relates to pensions and what people do while they're retired. My grandparents, on my father's side, my grandfather worked for General Electric his whole life, retired with a pension. He and my grandmother lived a very modest life. We would go up to see him, it's about six hours away. We'd go to the community pool, go swimming, play around the house, not really do a lot. And they lived for about 10 or 12 years in retirement. Their health wasn't great. My grandfather smoked, as Nicole and Pat and Rick and Eric can tell you, smoking and life insurance, expensive. And there's a reason for it being so expensive. So they didn't live a long time in retirement, very modest lifestyle. My parents, they both retired in the mid to late 90s. My dad lives in upstate New York with my stepmom. They just went on a, came back from a trip to Amsterdam and they took a cruise around there. My, my stepmother, believe it or not, actually goes on hikes with my mother. They kind of met at a family event. They became friends, so my stepmother and my mom go on hikes together, which is kind of odd. But trouble for your dad. <laughs> it's better than the alternative, I will say that. It's better than going on Judge Judy together. Um, and they, my, grand, my parents are coming out to visit me in California in a couple of months. Um, my mom and stepdad live in Orlando, Florida, on a lake. My stepdad is 81. He goes out and water skis almost every day. Um, they go on a two-week Colorado ski trip every year. Um, on a side note for the water skiing, my stepdad actually competes in tournaments, and most of the time he wins a medal. Now, given that the age band of 81 and above, there's not too many competitors, <laughs> it's probably wait a little bit, but he does go out there, they live out of lakes. Um, they tell me that they have to watch out for the alligators, so I think that's a good incentive for him to ski very well, too, so it doesn't fall over too often. Uh, my mom just went to visit my uncle in Switzerland uh, a couple years ago. My uncle works on the that big uh, proton accelerator project over there where they're trying to make black holes. She's never been to Switzerland, so she went to visit them. Uh, I could go on and on about a lot more details, but again, they're doing more things than my grandparents ever did. My mom calls me up and says, well, Matt, let's get on Skype so I can Skype with you and see this kind of stuff. You know, my grandparents would have never even known what a computer is, let alone Skype it. And then they're kind of my generation. And what I talk about with, with agents is, what's our retirement picture looking like? It, it's a big question mark. We talked about pensions. And I, if I had my slides, I could show you this, but the, if you can go online and get it, or the next time you get it in the mail, look at your social security statement. And it's not going to be verbatim what I tell you, but it's going to be pretty close. It says in 2016, Social Security will be paying out more than it takes in. And in 2037, if the funding doesn't change, then the Social Security Trust Fund will be exhausted. Who knows what's going to happen with Social Security in the future? Anyone in this room going to bank on it that it's going to be there? No. So when we talk about retirement, in the past we had what we call in the industry a three-legged retirement stool. Pensions are one leg, Social Security is another leg, personal savings are the third leg. Two of those are going through some major changes right now, and I don't see those two legs becoming strong again in the near future. So where does that leave us? Personal savings. So that's why we have people here like Brad and Justin talking about retirement income. Annuities are the only financial tool that can provide a guaranteed income as long as someone lives. As Justin said, yeah, the 4% rule, that's dead and gone. It's, it's not even a possibility. But to have some of the payouts that ING and Genworth and some of our other companies have, to be able to guarantee that income. Now I'll put another number up here on the board. And I apologize, I'm left-handed, so my handwriting is horrible. But for those of you in the back, that number is 50,270. And Mr. Read My Notes, do you know what that one represents? That's some kind of median income, probably. Nope. And unfortunately, not close. I don't want to say it's, but uh, no, it's not a median income. The average couple at 65 years old lives for 23 years while retired. Average How couple. How meals are going to eat? The number of meals are going to eat while retired. So if you take two people. I've seen a different number. That's why I didn't write you. Okay. 49,000 or something. That guy's okay. smart. Yeah. It's a two people, three meals a day. Hope that they eat every day. 23, that's a three. A lot of carbs. The number of meals they eat while they're retired. Hopefully they're, they're not splurging, but they're not starving. 10 bucks a meal, half a million dollars to eat while you're retired. 
And again, this is just food. We haven't mentioned if they have any housing costs, whether it's buying a new house or upkeep on their house. I don't know how long houses last, but I know they probably have to do something once in a while over 23 years. Hopefully you can fill up a car with gas, buy some new clothes that are not wearing fashion from 23 years ago that hopefully still fits. Turning the lights on, maybe seeing the grandkids once in a while. So this is the new reality of, I was talking to the guy last week. If you think about it, people are now starting to have to plan for being retired almost as long as they've been employed. So I was talking to the guy last week, he's in health benefits right now, he does group health and, and individual health, but with some upcoming pending changes, he's thinking about making a move to the income annuity side. And he's 55 years old, and I said, think about it, Franz. If you think 30 years ago, when you were 25, and you had a lump sum of money, how are you gonna figure out how to make that last over the next 30 years? Because that's what a lot of people in retirement are gonna do. And some people say, well, I have a 401k, or 201k, I can look at this big lump sum. I know how to manage, I know what I'm doing. Now, I'll say this on a quick antidote. I've played golf in the past. I've probably played, played six times. I don't know what I'm doing when I play golf. If you haven't watched me play golf, I'm not as bad as Charles Barkley, but I'm not that far from it. If people try to manage the money themselves without having an advisor there to talk to them about it, you're probably not gonna be that well off. I'm sure a lot of people have heard a lot of your stories. How many people have heard about someone winning 10, 20, 100 million dollars you get the smile at the convenience store, get a big check, they're happy. Then what happens? Friends start calling them, they start to spend, spend, spend. Five years down the road, back to worse off than they were before. Possibly criminal charges, I've seen a lot of stories, possibly jail time. People don't know how to manage money. And when they get that 401k when they're retired, like 59 and a half or 65, they don't know what to do with it. Put some money into some kind of guaranteed income stream so you can support your food, your clothes, your house your trips to your grandkids, anything that you need, your basic cost of living, have the annuity there to provide for that. And again, whether it's the strategies, the, the incomes, multipliers, there's a lot of options out there. And hopefully we, we've shown that we have some good options for you on both the life and annuity side. We have comparison tools. If everyone's seen that progressive commercial where they compare the rates of theirs and the other rates with it, we have comparison tools for the annuities. As Ryan said, we have an income comparison tool, fixed interest rates, speed comparison, we do the work for you. You figure out what your client needs, figure out what their goals are, we can provide the solutions. And annuities, as I said, great tool, the only financial tool that can provide income as long as you live. And again, I don't want to talk about too much about products, and we've had a lot of product information today. One thing that's kind of new in California that even though some products are not getting approved, we've just had a new product approved, we have some new hybrid annuity products. John Hancock, and I think North Americans said they have a long-term care rider on their product. We have annuities that do that. What's the big drawback with long-term care? Same thing with auto insurance, homeowner's insurance. Use it or lose it. You're paying you something for a while, and you don't use it, you feel like you got gypped. A lot of people feel that way with long-term care. Just like with the life side, on the annuity side, you can have a fixed annuity. If your clients need it, you can have a long-term care benefit. Some of them offer a true long-term care benefit. Some of them offer an enhanced benefit. It's not true long-term care, but it's an additional money for costs that come up. But the point is we have options for you that your clients don't have to feel like they're in a use it or lose it situation. The true long-term care hybrid annuity product does have some medical underwriting, not as intense as a standalone product, but because they're having that benefit, there are some features that they have to get underwritten for. But again, in addition to that, we have a wide selection of index annuities, fixed interest rate products, SPIA products. We have a lot of program tools that can show you how to help your clients generate income. I get email newsletters from a couple different services on a daily basis. One of them is called Insurance Newsnet. Some of you may get it, some of you may not. National Underwriter, Life and Health Pro. Usually in one of the top three articles, every single day, is gonna be something about boomers and retirement income. Boomers aren't saving enough. Retirement is scary. 4% is gone. All this, you know, It's a lot of woe and misery, possibly. But what it shows is it's an opportunity for the advisors to come in and say, you know what? We're going to take a chunk of your money and we're going to make sure that you have guaranteed income so you don't have to move in with your kids. So you don't have to go to a state or a facility that may or may not be what you want if you've worked 30 years to get to where you are. So retirement income is a definitely priority. It's, I've seen it more and more in the last two years than I've seen information about it over the last 15 years. It's such an important part right now. 
The boomers, boomers turn in 10, 000, or 65, 10,000 a day, huge population segment. They're the ones who have the assets, but they don't know how to manage them. Again, they need a coach out there in the golf course. The clients need a coach to help them figure out their retirement picture and retirement savings. I'm not going to say to put all their money toward an annuity, but again, put some money in there that they want to have guaranteed, and we have lots of different options. I'm not going to say, stand up here and again go over all the options we have because it's going to bore you to death. We have immediate options, deferred options, hybrid options increasing. They can save on pace with inflation. Anything that they need to do to have that guaranteed stream coming in so they can stay in their home or if they want to upgrade, they can do that. We have the options for you. So hopefully that kind of simplified things and wrapped it up on the income side and kind of told you about why there's such a focus on income these days with so many clients and so many carriers. Um, most carriers are coming out with income products. I mean, we've seen carriers that have never done index products before and are now coming out with income products on their index products. It, it's a focus, it's a need that's not being served in the economy today or in the country, and you have to be able to talk to clients and explain to them why they need to start planning for their income. That's all I have. Thanks, Matt.